Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. It's eight o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. Three hours of discussion, debate and plenty of fun along the way. Including my big opinion monologue, my take at 10, the panel and tomorrow's papers. We start with the People's Hour in which I'll be taking your video calls. The topics tonight, will nurses be forgiven for going on strike? Do the royal family have a problem with race? And are Christmas decorations tacky and outdated? I don't think so, but a poor woman has been criticised for having too many Christmas lights. Well, I'll be turning on your lights straight after the headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Parents are being urged to look out for symptoms of Strep A after six children under the age of 10 died from the infection. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating a rise in severe cases. Experts say a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. The Russian embassy is demanding to know why a wealthy Russian businessman has been arrested as part of an investigation into oligarchs. The 58-year-old was apprehended at his London home on suspicion of money laundering, conspiracy to defraud the Home Office and conspiracy to commit perjury. Two other men were also arrested in connection with money laundering. All three have since been released on bail. The EU, G7 and Australia have agreed a price cap on Russian oil in an effort to stop Moscow from profiting from the energy crisis. The limit has been set at $60 a barrel. On Friday, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67. However, Ukraine's President Zelensky says the price cap will do little to deter Russia from continuing its invasion. 
Well, protests have been held in over 40 locations across the United Kingdom over the fuel poverty crisis. Activists unfurled a banner on Westminster Bridge saying we demand to be warm this winter. Protesters say many people now can't afford to heat their homes, whereas energy companies continue to profit. Animal rebellion activists have staged a sit-in at two London restaurants. Eight people entered Salt Bay's steak restaurant in Knightsbridge and sat at tables that were already reserved. Video posted on the group's Twitter page appears to show one protester being ejected. A further 16 supporters occupied Manor, which features in the Michelin Guide. Animal Rebellion is calling for a plant-based future and say luxury dining represents climate devastation. England will face the winners of the Africa Cup of Nations tomorrow in their first match in the knockout stage of the World Cup. Senegal won their title only seven weeks ago and were runners-up in their group. However, the three Lions are favourites to go through to the next round. Well, ahead of that game, England captain Harry Kane has sent the best wishes of himself and his squad to former footballer Pele. The 82-year-old, who is currently battling colon cancer, was recently admitted to palliative care. Kane says he cherishes advice he received from the football legend, who he describes as an inspiration. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News, the People's Channel. Back now to Mark Dolan. My thanks to Ray Addison, who's back in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. And we start with the People's Hour, in which I'll be taking your video calls on the big stories of the day. Tonight, the stars of the show are Andrew in Dudley, Amanda in East Sussex, Michaela in Elgin in Scotland, Francis in Salisbury and Fergus in Greenwich. We'll be hearing from them over the next hour. My Saturday sidekicks for the first hour of the programme are the freedom-loving music legends Right Said Fred. Absolutely legendary chaps and great to have them in the studio. The topics uh, we will be debating. Will nurses be forgiven for going on strike? Do the royal family have a problem with race? And are Christmas decorations tacky and outdated? After nine, in my big opinion, as a man is arrested for apprehending criminals and going to jail, it's time to get tough on crime. That is my view. In the big question, with drunk colleagues and all sorts of sexual goings on, are Christmas parties a bad idea? Plus, the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Will William and Kate's trip to America be overshadowed by the Palace race scandal and Meghan and Harry's documentary? And in my news agenda with my panel, as Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner is filmed dancing and doing a DJ set, is it wrong for politicians to publicly let their hair down? And as a woman sues a food company because her recipe took too long to cook, have we lost the art of patience? Plus, tomorrow's paper's live and uninterrupted 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11.00. And in my take at 10, a woke pressure group wants to cancel Christmas. Well, I'll be cancelling them. No one is pulling my cracker. This is Mark Dolan tonight on a Saturday. So put something cold and fizzy in the fridge or fire up the kettle and let's have a night to remember. Your video calls in just a moment. But first, my look back at the week in Dolan's Diary. And what a week it's been. The Queen's former lady-in-waiting, Lady Susan Hussey, got into hot water when she asked a British domestic violence campaigner of Caribbean origin where she was originally from. Now, I sympathise with the campaigner. If I was pressed on where I'm really from, I'd have to admit it was Kentish Town, and that's really embarrassing. The Conservatives appear to be in free fall, trailing Labour in the polls and losing the Chester City by-election by a margin not seen for 200 years. Particularly concerned was a good friend of mine, the popular Tory backbencher Jacob Rees-Mogg, who remembers that first election back in the early 1800s. Angela Rayner, the Labour deputy leader, has raised a few eyebrows dancing 
and doing a DJ set in Manchester last night. Here she is in action, giving it large. I wonder if Labour are celebrating victory too soon. I suspect this video could be used by Tory candidates across the country asking which is the serious choice to lead Britain. Rainer break breakdancing could break Labour's chances in two years' time. The No Sugar Sherlock Award this week goes to Medical Chief Chris Whitty, admitting thousands more people will die from lockdowns, not as a result of COVID, but due to the lockdowns themselves. He's also said the Pope's a Catholic, bears relieve themselves in the woods, Gaza likes a drink and Mick Jagger thoroughly enjoys the company of women. The NHS will grind to a halt on the 20th of December under plans being discussed for a coordinated Christmas strike in England and Wales by nurses, ambulance workers and hospital staff. It means that people that need urgent medical help won't be able to get it. In other words, it will be no different to how things currently are. The media have been up in arms about China's attempts to control COVID by locking up the public. Many outlets have praised the brave protesters on the streets of Beijing. What a shame they were so quiet when brave, honest Brits did the same thing when our own government destroyed our rights and freedoms in 2020. I'm so shocked at the media and their double standards. Terribly out of character. Leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, is to end the charitable status of private schools, which means thousands of kids could be priced out landing taxpayers with a bill of several hundred million pounds to accommodate them in the state sector. This policy just doesn't add up. And it surprises me because Keir Starmer went to a really good fee-paying school himself. He should have done his homework. Sorry, Keir. Must try harder. See me after class. It's been revealed that woke hypocrites Gary Lineker made a fortune working for Qatar State Broadcaster as he fronted the Champions League coverage from 2009 to 2013, when the regime wasn't exactly a hotbed of human rights. I'm so confused. I thought he hated this regime so much and was heading off to the World Cup so reluctantly. I can think of a few million reasons why he swallowed his pride. Monkeypox, finally, has been given a new name by global health experts for fear it could be seen as racist. Given that no one in their right mind would make such a link, the only thing we can conclude from this name change is that it's global health experts and none of the rest of us who are actually racist. And that is Dolan's Diary. Well, with me for the next hour, pop icons and freedom lovers, right said Fred. Boys, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Whitty announces the lockdowns will cause thousands of deaths <laughs> yes. related to COVID. Yes. There's a surprise. Uh, it, it, yes. Shocker. I know, shocker. Yes. I don't know. Locking down healthy people. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought, you know? Yeah, didn't he get an OBE? Was he, did he get a, yeah, he got, or a knighthood uh, or something? Well, I know, like uh, yeah. I know that Patrick Valance got a knighthood did for his yes, uh, work yeah. during yeah. the pandemic. Yes. Well, Chris exactly. Whitty must have got something. I'd, if I was him, I'd be Well, the furious. bottom line is he's still in a job, which is my concern. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah exactly, exactly. Yes. I mean, I just... Uh... Is he pole dancing? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably, OK. I just thought I'd ask Very good. <laughs> is he pole dancing? Yeah, he could do something with slides whilst he's on the pole. <laughs> yeah, 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 next slide. Yeah, next slide. Slide, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I mean, these, I, I just... This is a perfect storm. We've got some of them... Uh, it's at, at the most crucial time in history, we have some of the worst people yes. in public life. It's really, really depressing. In fairness to Witty, he was just part of this uh, Western approach to the pandemic. Yes, it was, it was, was just outliers like Sweden who took a different route. But yeah, the bottom yes. line is that they're not alone. My concern is that when we have the great inquiry, yeah. uh, they won't look at whether lockdowns were a good or a bad idea. It'll be that old debate about we should have locked down sooner. Sooner, yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. I, it is, I did a, the, the quarantine thing, or the, mm. the lockdown thing, was a really weird... Locking down healthy people was a really odd yes. thing. And... Uh, I think I just think we'll be living with it for ages. And also, it got people out of the habit of working. It got people out of the habit of, of leaving their home and socialising and doing all that stuff. And there's all yeah. sorts of stuff now coming out with kids, uh, about children who are failing to socialise properly, yeah. and failing to lip read, particularly in countries where masks are still mandatory, failing to lip read, mm. can't understand what people are saying. You know, so it's... Uh, I don't think... I think politicians, generally speaking, are so profoundly dumb yeah. that they don't... And they don't understand... 
they have their own little circle. They go to the, the bar in the House of Commons and they yeah. mix and min mingle and all that sort of stuff. But they don't truly understand what the rest of the people in this country are like. So we have Richie Sunak bunging £50 million of taxpayers' money to the criminal enterprise in, uh, in Ukraine, mm. and we have food banks in the UK. Mm. I don't understand what's going on. It's a, it's a mystery to me. Well, I guess, so, you know, his argument would be that Russia has invaded Ukraine and that uh, ultimately Putin must be defeated. Mm. Clearly, clearly there's a debate to be had there. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to COVID, you know, I would take the view that you're both on the right side of history. You've been very courageous speaking up against the lockdowns. You've yes, been called well, all yes. sorts of things like <laughs> granny killer, yes. Yes. heartless, yes. Uh, yes. right wing, which I don't understand why being against no. lockdowns well, is I know, right wing. I know. Well, the, the left, apart from being not very humorous, uh, aren't they, well, aren't they bright? So we, they put far in front of right, so Fred. Yes. Very clear. It's brilliant. Yeah, how did they come up with that? <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. You know, um, and yeah. that, we get, we, we have had that a lot. It's got and, better, um, actually. It has got a little better. I, I don't know about, maybe you've experienced the same thing, but sure. what the, the grief I get or we get online mm. is never, ever echoed on the street. Yeah. Never. No. We've never had one person come up to say, I think you should have saw, you're yeah. outrageous, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. We've never had it once. And, we, and we, we, we're not difficult to find and we go out to bars and clubs or restaurants or whatever. So we, it's not like we hide away. But we've never... In fact, we've, in fact, it's always the opposite. People come up and thank us for speaking out. And blah, blah, blah. Also, there's, there's this assumption... We spoke to a lady, or a lady spoke to us a few weeks ago, and we were all on the same page with regards to COVID and everything else. And then, she, in, a, in a sort of... In a quiet voice, she leaned across and she said... Are you flat earthers? <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, no, so "That's your next battle." That's the next battle. Yeah. So we said, "We're not actually," and, and she was a bit shocked. Yeah. I said, "But don't, yeah, tell us about. Tell us why you think it." You know. yeah. So I quite enjoy the conversation. She thinks there's a dome. Yeah. Right. Over a flat earth. That's yeah. what she believes. Okay. And what I like about that is that she felt comfortable to have that conversation. Yeah. I like Correct. people I, saying I, that. I, I don't believe that for a second. But yeah. That's her. That's her business. Well, when it comes to uh, lockdowns, which I personally believe to have been a failed policy, yeah, uh, do, do you think that? that the truth will out? And if so, will it happen in our lifetime? I think We've talked about this. I'm talk certain yeah. in 50 years' time, there'll be kids in classrooms going, what the hell were they thinking? I think I, I definitely... I think that's But true. I, I yes. do wonder whether there's an entire political and scientific elite whose job it is now to demonstrate mm. lockdowns were the right thing to do. Because yes. if not, they're all absolutely buggered. Yes, yes they, they are. are. They I are. think they have to, one way or another, prove it was... You know, what's that lady said um, at the speed of science, wasn't it? That was yeah, the quote. speed of science. And, and, you know, and, um, <laughs> and I think there's a bit of that, you know, we didn't have... There wasn't enough time. We had to do what we thought was best at the time. And, yeah. and, and you see Piers Morgan back... But at the, the time, we said it was a bad idea. We, we did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those of us I did. I guess, again, the, yeah. the other great uh, myth is this idea that the, the COVID... By the way, a nasty virus, which was, you know, yes, fatal absolutely. to a small yeah. proportion of the population, yeah. vulnerable. We, we lost too many people to the virus. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't the bubonic plague. Uh, we actually knew that pretty much from day one. Yes, yes, In fact, yes, it was yes. the likes of Witty and Valence who said this is a mild virus. Yeah, uh, the indeed. government campaign said 30% of people will have no symptoms. Yes. Act like you've got it. Yes, yes exactly. We stopped the world yeah, yes. for a pandemic you had, prete you had to pretend to have. Exactly, yes. exactly. And Hancock said in, in the House that um, it was uh, children weren't at threat, uh, um, in, no, at, in risk. Term, at risk in terms of um, the, the vaccine wouldn't be required for children. I think he uh, said that now. Also, I remember... Oh, when yes, he did. Yes, yes he did. And, and, the, and the JCVI, who are the yes. uh, vaccines agency, yeah. uh, recommended against vaccinating children. The yes. government did it anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I, I, are they anti-vaxxers too, then? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That term, I mean, that that term, term got my just, nutty. Yeah, exactly. Because you, it, because we're, 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 we've, we've had vaccines, uh, like most people, on awful our lives, particularly... Uh, we went uh, toured in India, so we had malaria, um, jabs. Polio as kids. Um, polio as kids. Well, you're right, said Fred, you'll have any concoction, won't you? Oh, <laughs> yes. You grab, <laughs> I mean, you're in rock music. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. we'll take anything. We yeah, will. you rack them out, be right. But <laughs> it's going to be your choice, not someone else's. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well, exactly. That, that is the, that, that's our thing. When people said, well, you, you used to do this and that. Yeah. And I said, yes, I did. And it was my choice. No, I wasn't coerced. I, that's the decision I made. Yeah. Not a very bright decision, but it was the one I made. And that's the difference now, which is, the, 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 I think, the one of the most disgusting Disgusting um, headlines was no jab, no job. Yeah, that was just. I mean, yeah, uh, no, yeah, no jab. No, no jab, yeah. yeah, that was um, yeah. Pemberley Code Plumbers actually went down that road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Charlie, Tre Charlie Mullins. Yeah. Mm, that's true. Uh, a, a brief word on. Angela Rayner, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, yes. uh, <laughs> doing a sort of DJ set and some dancing yes. in Manchester last night. Yes. Um, I, was she playing I'm Too Sexy? No. 
I shouldn't, I shouldn't think so. We didn't write it for her. I think she was playing prodigy <laughs> slap my bitch up. I, yeah. I, don't, I, I, thing, I don't know what she was playing. The thing is, it's rather like Matt Hancock in The Jungle and stuff. These people are not serious politicians, I don't think. No, I mean, we're running I, the pictures now yeah, of, of they're, this. They're not, and they're not, I'm I mean, sort look, of mixed. Can I just say, I'm sort of mixed about this, because on the one hand, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with... Op she should be at home reading the Rome Treaty. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think. Yes, yeah, you're yeah. right. Well, yeah. look, uh, plenty to debate with the boys. Right, said Fred, live in the studio. And it's your viewer calls next. And our first discussion is a big one. Will the public ever forgive nurses for going on strike? See you shortly. On Mark Dolan tonight, after nine, my big opinion monologue and US news with the Queen of American Media, Kinsey Schofield, plus my all-star panel and tomorrow's papers. And in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with woke lunatics trying to cancel Christmas in the name of diversity. No one's pulling my cracker. That's Mark Dolan tonight on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight, which starts at the earlier time of 8 p.m. every Friday and Saturday. We kick off with the People's Hour, in which I take your video calls, and it's time for our first topic, as it's been revealed that nurses will not attend accident, emergency or intensive care wards whilst on strike. So it begs the question, will the public forgive their actions if patients suffer or even die? Uh, let's speak to Amanda in East Sussex. Hi, Amanda. 
Park, how are you? I'm very well. How are you keeping on this uh, chilly Saturday night? It's freezing out there, isn't it? It is, yes. I've got my roll neck jumper on and um, two pairs of socks. So, yeah, it's very cold. <laughs> yeah, you'll need that. And you're in East Sussex, which is uh, right on the coast. Well, it's lovely to have you on the programme. I'm sure that medical services are overstretched in East Sussex as they are across the country. Uh, do you think that the public will hold a grudge towards nurses if they down tools in December? Um, I think initially, maybe not, um, because I know that people are very sympathetic, you know, that they worked really, really hard during the pandemic. Um, the thing is, though, you know, we were cajoled into clapping for them every week during the pandemic and, um, you know, making sacrifices ourselves by staying at home. And many, many people were too frightened to go to the doctors or the hospitals you know, when they were becoming very, very ill. And now we're seeing the consequences of that um, with excess deaths and, and, you know, various diagnoses that perhaps we wouldn't have seen if they'd have allowed us to carry on living fairly normally and just locking down the vulnerable and the elderly, which I truly believe that's what they should have done. Um, so I think the thing is, the nurses have had a a pay rise already. I think it was 4%, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I think to be asking now um, for 17% when the rest of the country are not getting a pay rise at all from, you know, anyone from the private sector or any of the other public sector positions, they're not getting pay rises. Um, so to be asking for 17%, I think is a little bit too much for the public to swallow. And I think eventually, if this drags on through Christmas and the new year and beyond, I think the public will get very, very frustrated and, and they will lose their support. So personally, I don't blame them for wanting to ask for a little bit more, you know, in terms of, of a, pay, a pay rise, but I don't believe they're going to ever get the 17% that they're asking for. And I don't believe that, that they should get that either. Um, stay where you are, Amanda. Let's speak now to Michaela, who is in Elgin in Scotland. Hi, Michaela. How are you? I'm very well. Very excited to have you on the show. Uh, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight and the People's Hour. Do you think the public will forgive the nurses for going on strike, especially if patients suffer or even die? Well, um, an EPOS market research conducted on the 21st of November, details that three in five adults support the nurses taking strike action. Half believe the RCN's requested pay rise is too high. So that agrees with exactly what Amanda said. Mm. Rejecting the government's pay rise of 5% on average the RCN is currently demanding the pay rise of 5% above inflation, which would equate it to the 17%. Now, the Health and Social Care Secretary, Steve Barker, said the RCN's requests are around three times what millions of people outside the public sector will typically receive and simply aren't reasonable or affordable. Now, the EPOS study revealed strongest support for strikes are among younger people. Across um, all age groups, 59% support the strikes and 24% oppose the strikes. Now, 18 to 24 year olds had the highest support. Older people had much higher opposition levels to the strikes. But overall, 47% said the RCN's suggested pay offer was too high. So again, that goes with what Amanda has said. Now, Kate Juxbury, who's the research director at EPOS, said the public support for strikes is strong, a strong majority. However, uh, most think the pay rise is too high, and that's detailed on the Nursing Practice website. Now, the RCN echoes the EPOS research with a YouGov poll showing 65% of the public support nursing staff taking strike action. Just 
Although just one in two Britons are now confident in the quality of care available to them on the NHS. Right. And the, and the majority, 79% seven, of respondents said they believed there aren't enough nursing staff in the NHS S to deliver safe patient care. Now, today, one in eight nursing roles in the NHS in England alone are vacant, and an open letter to the Prime Minister demanding fair pay for nursing staff to protect patient safety has gathered over 50,000 signatures, and that's on the rcn.org well, Amanda, website. Amanda, you've, you've outlined a lot of really, really important statistics there in relation to the nurses and their claim for a better pay package. And I think many would agree that they do deserve a bump in their wages. But I don't remember any of these nursing unions speaking out against lockdowns, which cost the economy half a trillion pounds, which is why we can't afford that pay rise. Um, what do you think, though, personally, Michaela? Because I just wonder whether, if patients start to suffer, the mood will change and a majority will turn against the nurses. Yeah. Michaela? Are you asking? Oh. Um, well, I think that if, yes, yeah, certainly if people start to die, then I do think the public will possibly turn against the strike, considering they're not happy with the fact that they're asking so much for so much. And many in these statistics which have been quoted have said that they're not ha they're, they're happy to support the strike just now, which is what Amanda said, but not the amount. So yeah. that, I think, could balance if people start to uh, die or, or things start to go wrong. I think public opinion most definitely could be swayed against the strikes. OK. Uh, well, look, final thoughts on this one, Amanda. Uh, I, I just wonder whether the nurses set a worrying precedent by going on strike. It will be their first strike in 106 years. Yes, I, I do think that they will be setting a bad precedent. And the thing is, we already have, you know, so many other strikes going on at the moment in the country. This really was the last thing that the country needed, and especially at Christmas and, and into the new year, which is basically, you know, the, the start of the coldest part of the winter. So it, it's really not fair on the elderly and the vulnerable, I don't think, to be doing this. And, you know, the way I see it is that, People that go into the nursing profession, they go into it because they they should be caring about looking after patients first, not looking after their own purses first. And I appreciate that they need to have a certain amount to be able to live and to be able to feed, the, feed their own families. But when it comes to the detriment of the population that they're supposed to be taking care of, I do think there needs to be a balance in their decision making when it comes to going on strike. OK, Amanda, Michaela, brilliant debate. Let's ask the Freds what they think. Right, said Fred. Uh, boys, uh, the NHS faces a waiting list of seven million people. Yes. Uh, we've got uh, the, the winter flu crisis. Covid cases are up. Yep. Uh, we've got children going down with nasty infections. Yes. Now is not the time to go on strike. Uh, I th yes, it's not what great timing. The trouble is the messages have been mixed. Uh, we've seen the nurses doing their, their videos and their dancing. People won't forget that. I thought it was brilliant. Be quiet. And all, <laughs> the other thing is we see Matt Hancock, as an example, monetising his position in office. Mm. We see that greed. We see um, Rishi Sunak and his £400 loafers or whatever, whatever yeah. he wears. And I think, I think, that, I think the, the feeling will be mixed. It'll be on the one hand, people feel that the rich are getting richer and those who are at the, those who actually those who are needed by society aren't being taken care yeah. of yeah. but on the other hand people will remember during the lockdown as you say where were the unions supporting uh, where, where, where were their voices when the lockdowns were happening? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a mixed message yeah. also it's, it's the same kind of blackmail in a way that's got, been going on with the, the um, RMT. Yes. You know, it's the same kind of, you know, you shouldn't be striking because, you know, the inconvenience that it's going to cause and some people might be dying. In a way, it's very, I think it's really unfair that we haven't had come at this late stage in this country's life that we haven't got to some kind of fundamental agreement about how you pay essential workers.
Yeah. Uh, I think it's yeah, ridiculous. It's I think it's absolutely ridiculous. That every year or every two years, we go through this ludicrous thing of strikes and then squeeze with the employer saying we won't do this and then the union say we'll do it. I mean, come on, guys, let's get it to, you know, I don't know, link it to inflation, whatever you need to do. But with essential workers, if I was an essential worker, um, key, I would... Well, key workers, they were called. Key workers, yeah. <laughs> were Exa Exactly. I would expect yeah. to feel safe it, with my income. I would expect to know what next year was going to bring. I yes. wouldn't want to be continually going from hand to mouth, thinking about strike action and getting slagged off in the press and undermining my the role that I have. I think we need to come up with a much better system than this. I think it's completely Ooh. ridiculous. It needs to look at, doesn't it, as does the wider NHS. Uh, thanks to Amanda and Michaela and the Freds, who return very shortly. Lots more to debate in the uh, People's Hour. If you'd like to be part of a future show, drop me a line right now, mark at gbnews.uk. Coming up in the wake of Lady Susan Hussey being sacked from the royal household after 60 years of service following a race row, I'll be taking more viewer calls and asking, does royalty have a problem with racism? See you shortly. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6 a.m., you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know, the latest headlines, opinions, and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6 a.m., it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. This is a guy who went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight and the People's Hour in which I'm taking your video calls. Uh, news breaking in the last hour of an intervention by the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. She has revealed that uh, the head of the police watchdog um, has been told by her to resign or face immediate suspension after he became the subject of a criminal investigation. Michael Lockwood had been the Director General 
uh, of the Independent Office for Police Conduct since 2018 until he resigned. More on that in our headlines with Ray on the hour. But first, after the Queen's former lady-in-waiting, Lady Susan Hussey, steps down after being accused of racism for asking a British domestic abuse campaigner where she comes from, and following accusations by Meghan Markle of alleged remarks about their then-baby Archie and the colour of his skin, do the royals have a problem with race? Um, we'll debate that with Richard and Fred Fairbrass, the Freds, very shortly. But let's speak to Andrew in Dudley. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? All right. It's hoping nice and warm in that cosy studio of yours. It is, really. I've got the lights and I've got the warm company of Right Said Fred, who are Wonderful. on fire tonight. Absolutely. There they are. But uh, you've got your scarf on and your fleece. Uh, how insulated yeah. is your home in Dudley, by the way, Andrew? Are you drafty? Uh, freezing cold, actually. Uh, okay. We're trying to put the heating on. Yeah, no. Because we just keep looking at the smart meter and it just keeps going and going and going. You know, it's just yeah. haywire, the smart meter. It really is. I know it's a very uh, it's a very guilty device to be looking at. Uh, listen, Andrew, let's talk about royal racism. Is it a yeah. problem? Yeah, I think I'm a royalist. Uh, I love the royal family. I think it's a great institution. Uh, it's great for the country. They bring a lot of revenue into the country. Really great thing to have. It's revered by the rest of the world. But it's been a bad week for the royals this week, the royal household. Uh, it's that conversation that uh, Lady uh, Hussey had, uh, which, which turned into a car crash, mm. uh, just just didn't help at all. And by the way, if Lady Hussey is uh, looking in tonight, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm black country, born and bred, and I actually uh, uh, live in Cradley Heath, which was the place where they made the chain for the anchor that went on the Titanic. So that's oh, wow. my... Uh, pedigree, so I'm fine. I think I think I'm safe hands with Lady Ussy, but uh, with the the black woman uh, and uh, the, the all the questioning, the awkward questions that came out, I think that did a lot of damage this week. Mm. Uh, yes, well, I have to say I spoke to a top royal insider, Andrew, earlier today, and he told me in confidence that Lady Hussey has form on this. She's a bit of a bull in a china shop. In fact, he described her as a, a rather unpleasant woman. But look, uh, I, I'm sure that she's not here to defend herself and, uh, and her friends and family would refute that suggestion. But I did get that from a, a well-appointed source uh, that she has been considered something of a liability in the past. Um, but uh, Andrew, uh, stay there because uh, let's uh, speak, if we can, to Fergus in Greenwich, who also joins us on this one. Do you agree with Andrew that there is a problem with racism in royal ranks? Not for a moment, no. Poor Lady Hussey was hung out to dry. She was set up by a Barbadian woman dressed as an African whose real name is English. And she, she wore this wonderful, beautiful African costume. And, of course, Lady Hussey went, wow, where do you come from? Now, there's a thing I remember from many years ago. If, you, uh, if the Queen and Prince Philip were on a walkabout... They said, if you wear some startling clothes or a funny hat, they will talk to you. Because the royals were always thinking, how can I connect with this person out of thousands in the audience in front of me? And, of course, if somebody dresses strangely, where does that come from? Well, where do you come from? It was a setup. It's horrible, but the whole thing was a setup. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's uh, quite an accusation. I'm sure that the lady involved would deny it. Uh, let's have Fergus and Andrew, if we can, and we'll go back... Uh, to Andrew on this one. Uh, this, of course, Andrew, hot on the heels of Meghan Markle's accusations of racism within the royal family itself in relation to their then unborn child, Archie, and what he might look like when he's born. Yes, I mean, the, um, the, the, the identity of that uh, person uh, ne never came out, of course. Uh, but uh, that, as well as the documentary that's uh, coming out on uh, on Netflix, uh, we don't know what re revelations there's going to be uh, in that uh, in that documentary. Uh, something could come out of that, uh, I guess. Uh, Me Meghan Markle, of course, um, as as you quite rightly say, has voiced concerns uh, 
uh, previously about uh, racism uh, within within the institution, within within the firm, as I think they call it. So um, you know, it's going to be an interesting one when the Netflix uh, documentary airs, uh, just to see what uh, comes out of that. Andrew, if you think there is a problem with racism in the royal family, how do they fix it, Andrew? Uh, I think it's up to the king. He's a good. He seems to have made a good start on it, uh, but he's he's going to have to put some reforms in, I think, and uh, and, and use his uh, use his power to, uh, to 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 change things around. Uh, he needs to uh, put the best foot forward mm. uh, and uh, and really stamp out these these incidents. Because these incidents uh, only uh, come out when they come into the public domain. You don't know what's happening behind closed doors. So if there is something going on behind closed doors, it needs to come from the top downwards to try and uh, to try and clear the problem up. Uh, however, Fergus, you think this has been blown out of proportion? I think it's been created deliberately. If you, if, if I'm going to do my Starkey thing again. The ancient Greeks were not ancient Greeks, they were ancient Athenians, and all the other Greeks were called pagans. Well, they were called Pagani, which meant people of the countryside, and they were ignored. They were so far beneath the, the Athenians. Now, what we've got is a royal family, the wonderful great queen who's died recently. When the, um, the empire was disbanded, she said, let's make a commonwealth of nations for all the people. 54 countries, and there was no racism there, not at all. She and Philip travelled the world, as has Charles. They don't really don't even notice race. And I would have to say thank you to you and the other chap as well. I'm half Belfast Irish and half Yorkshire, and I've got a Nigerian sister by attention and a, a brother by another mother. <laughs> Niger um, West Indian. So I don't do race. I hate that stuff. And I can't see it in the royal family at all. I really can't. OK, I'm, fascinating. I'm very fussy about it as well. Yeah, well, I, I think it's wonderful that you can't see race. And uh, I was hoping that our society had become colourblind um, until approaches like critical race theory, which is an ideology that suggests you are racist by dint of the colour of your skin, which is surely in itself... A racist sentiment. Um, boys, Andrew and Fergus, a fascinating debate. We have Richard and Fred Fairbrass in the studio. Right, said Fred. Uh, Richard, where exactly are you from? Your people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, actually, we, I mean, I mean, sort of legendary rock stars. Well, for, for, for uh, my birthday present, um, Fred's wife got me the DNA testing thing. Right. You know where you do, you get your DNA thing, and I'm where uh, I am. Is it is it wise to do a blood test on right said Fred? Well, it, I, Probably, it's I was, not going to make for pretty no. reading, is it? <laughs> I was hoping for something exotic, you know, <laughs> sort of I don't know, related to a Russian czar or Ooh, something. Sure. Uh, but anyway, I'm from the, I'm 22 percent Irish from. The, the rebellion southern, the rebellious Cork southern. And Kerry. Cork and Kerry. Yeah. We've seen a bit yeah. of rebel in you in the last couple of years, well, that, haven't we? We're wondering whether that's where it comes from. Yes. I, don't, I don't know. Well, one thing I will say to Andrew before he goes, take your smart meter off, put it in the... Throw it away <laughs> and get a regular meter. You're, you're, they, they, they do not work. Right, interesting. You, what, do you think people are being overcharged? I, well, people are being overcharged and you have no control over it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, dear. Mm. Uh, GB News is on a smart meter. <laughs> we'll close this down tomorrow. <laughs> Um, how about you, Fred? Uh, what, what do you think about this story? Was it a stitch-up, or do you think this uh, lady was uh, genuinely a victim of racism? Um, I don't think she was a victim of racism, no. My wife is African, mm. half Nigerian, uh, half Egyptian. She gets asked on a regular basis where she's from, because she speaks very English. She was, very, uh, she was schooled over here. Yeah. Um, and um, about 80% of our closest family members are black or people of colour. So uh, and, um, and they and all different shades. So they they themselves also got quite yeah. asked quite regularly where you're from because um, it's quite an interesting mix. So it's exactly. not. I, I don't think it was racism. I think it's just curiosity. Maybe she was a bit clumsy when she did it. I don't yeah. know. Also, this but, Christmas you know. when we have Christmas lunch. The white people around the table will be in the minority. There's only two of us. Every, there's only two of us. Yeah. Everybody else is black. I don't yeah. care. It, I yes. never. It just doesn't matter. I think the, what you've mentioned about when you mentioned critical, critical race theory, it's, it's completely at odds 
with Martin Luther King and his thing, yeah. which is judge people by the content of their heart, of their soul, yeah. rather than the colour of their skin. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know why we've suddenly backtracked on this. It's, it's bizarre, I think. Amen to that. Uh, well, thank you, boys, and thank you to Andrew and Fergus as well. Uh, next up, should we judge people by the colour of their Christmas decorations? Uh, we'll debate that. A woman's been trolled for having too many lights. So are Christmas decorations tacky and outdated? Uh, we'll catch up with uh, some of our brilliant callers next. <laughs> Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, for your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight and the People's Hour in which I'm taking your video calls. If you'd like to be part of a future show, drop me a line right now, mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, now, the Sun newspaper report that the father of four, Dan Taylor, was criticised by his neighbours for putting up his Christmas lights and decorations too early. Well, he's blasted them as Killjoy Scrooges, as his inflatable Santa appeared... <laughs> In early November, that's not a euphemism. <laughs> so it begs the question, are Christmas decorations a much-needed source of joy at this dark time of the year, or are they tacky and outdated? We've got another story of a woman that was abused and trolled for having 10,000 lights in her house because she enjoys the Christmas decorations so much. Uh, so let's now speak to and get the views of Francis in Salisbury. Hi, Francis. Uh, we're just getting a line to Francis right now, so if you bear with us. I've always been a big fan of Christmas decorations, but here is Francis. There he is, Francis. Uh, you don't have your decorations, but you do have 
your gorgeous dog, whose name is? Chaos. Lovely Chaos. Look, it's yeah. great to have you you back on the program. Great to see Chaos again. Um, will there be tinsels around those uh, frames behind you come Christmas? Yes. And some lights. Lots of LED lights. I'm not going to spend too much. Um, I'm afraid I live in a small flat, so I can't go and buy a native um, tree. So I've had to buy a fake tree, but last year I was having an amputation, so it's sort of a bit different this year, um, so I can actually celebrate. And I think the important thing about this time of the year is that Christmas, and we must remember it's Christmas. I know we are still quite a proportion of secular people, but the majority in the country of a minority, admittedly now, mm. are Christian. And we must celebrate Christianity for what it is, which is a festival of light, of carols, of Advent, the story to the birth of Christ. Um, we started Advent last Sunday, 27th of November, and it will carry through to the night before Christmas Day. So it's a festival of light, making up for this bleak midwinter, which this year is very bleak. So I'm very much in favour of everybody lighting up, um, heralding, you know, the new year. Some of it may be a bit tacky, but that's personal choice, isn't it? And I'm not against people who want to invest in <laughs> um, lighting up everything. Um, I wince sometimes at the cost of what they're doing in this sort of straightened times. <laughs> but, you know, come on, we've got to try and enjoy ourselves, not be shut down by these bleak monsters that just want to kill us off. No, Christianity, let's celebrate the birth of Christ, the build up to the birth of Christ with light, with carols, um, through our Advent, um, engage all our children in what is and should be a great festival. We should avoid mammon, and I accept that some of the secular side of Christmas has got out of hand in terms of buying Christmas presents and things like that. But no, let's just reflect. It's religion. It's a great festival. All the other um, religions in the country respect Christianity, as indeed we respect Diwali and other um, religions. So let's be positive. Let's be very positive. Yes, some of it will be a bit tacky. Never mind. That's personal choice. But I enjoy the fact that so many people go to such effort to brighten things up. Absolutely. I mean, life actually is pretty dodgy at the moment. Well, look, uh, Fergus has got his tree out. You can see that there, Francis. <laughs> it's a whopper. Size is everything. Well, mine, mine's not going to be much bigger. Yeah. Mine's well, only that's, going to be full that's not what I've heard. And Andrew's got, got uh, some kind of Christmas character with him. It looks like an emaciated elf. Yes. And I'm is. sure that Amanda... You're not the type of bloke who's got a couple of blow-up Santa Clauses in his garden as well. How did you know? Um, let me ask all, all four of you, raise your hand if you think that Christmas decorations are tacky and outdated. No, they're not having it. Um, how about the Freds? Uh, boys, what do you think? Because I think it's a class thing. I think it's snobbery. And sometimes you go to these rather posh middle-class households and they haven't got anything no. up, just a couple of sprigs of holly. <laughs> yeah, yes. I think that's probably Which true. Which I think is rubbish. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree, yeah. I agree. I think it's a real shame. I'm not uh, a man of a religious person particularly, but I do think it's a real shame. If you drive down Oxford Street, all the Christmas decorations up until, I don't know what they're like this year, have been very secular. Mm. You know, there's pictures of stars and, and, and moons. And it's and, all happy holiday. And yeah, and it's happy holidays. Happy holiday, yeah. it, it, I agree. I completely agree. It's a, it's a religious festival. And I think even if you're not religious, you should not be ashamed of admitting that that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I agree with Francis. It's all... I think we should just unclench, let people do what they want to yeah, do. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Too right. And there are so many non-Christians <clears throat> who love Christmas too. Uh, my thanks to the fabulous Richard and Fred Fairbrass. Right said Fred, who will return to the programme very, very soon indeed. And thanks to my fantastic 
the viewers uh, who tuned in and took part in the People's Hour, Michaela, Amanda, Andrew, Fergus and Francis, um, if you want to be involved, then join this gang next week, marketgbnews.uk. Lots more to come, including my big opinion. See you shortly. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay, not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch-up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, as a man is arrested and jailed for apprehending criminals, it's time to get tough on crime. In the big question, with drunk colleagues and all sorts of naughty goings on, are Christmas parties a bad idea? Plus, the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. And in the news agenda with my panel, as Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, is filmed dancing and doing a DJ set, is it wrong for politicians to publicly let their hair down? And as a woman sues a food company because her recipe took too long to cook, have we lost the art of patience? Plus tomorrow's papers, and in my take at 10, a woke pressure group wants to cancel Christmas. Not on my watch. I'll see you after the headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. And in breaking news, the Home Secretary says she told the head of the police watchdog to resign or face immediate suspension after he became the subject of a criminal investigation. 
Michael Lockwood had been Director General of the Independent Office for Police Conduct since 2018. He resigned yesterday, citing personal and domestic reasons. In a statement, Suella Braverman said she took immediate action upon being made aware that police are investigating a historic allegation. Parents are being urged to look out for symptoms of Strep A after six children under the age of 10 died from the infection. Symptoms are usually mild, but the UK Health Security Agency is now investigating a rise in severe cases. Experts say a lack of mixing during the COVID-19 pandemic could be behind a drop in immunity. Animal rebellion activists have staged sit-ins at two restaurants in London and Manchester. Eight people entered Salt Bay's steak restaurant in Knightsbridge and sat at tables that were already reserved. Video posted on the group's Twitter page appears to show one protester being ejected. A further 16 supporters occupied Manor in Manchester, which features in the Michelin Guide. Animal Rebellion is calling for a plant-based future and say luxury dining represents climate devastation. Protests have been held in over 40 locations across the UK over the fuel poverty crisis. Activists unfurled a banner on Westminster Bridge saying, we demand to be warm this winter. Protesters say many people now can't afford to heat their homes, whereas energy companies continue to profit. The EU, G7 and Australia have agreed a price cap on Russian oil in an effort to stop Moscow profiting from the energy crisis. The limit has been set at $60 a barrel. On Friday, Russian crude oil was trading at around $67. However, Ukraine's President Zelensky says the price cap will do little to deter Russia from continuing its invasion. England will face the winners of the Africa Cup of Nations tomorrow in their first match in the knockout stage of the World Cup. Senegal won their title only seven weeks ago and were runner-up in their group. However, the three Lions are favourites to go to the next round. Well, meanwhile, ahead of that game, England captain Harry Kane has sent the best wishes of himself and his squad to former footballer Pele. The 82-year-old, who's currently battling colon cancer, was recently admitted to palliative care, where he's said to be stable. Kane says he cherishes advice he received from the football legend, who he describes as an inspiration. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're watching GB News. Back now to Mark. Many thanks to Ray Addison, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Uh, big opinions, big guests, and always big stories. In my big opinion monologue, as a man is arrested and jailed for apprehending criminals, it's time to get tough on crime. In the big question, with drunk colleagues and all sorts of naughty goings on, are Christmas parties for the office a bad idea? Plus, the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Will William and Kate's trip to America be overshadowed by the Palace race scandal and Meghan and Harry's documentary? And in the news agenda with my panel, as Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, is filmed dancing and doing a DJ set, is it wrong for politicians to publicly let their hair down? Take a look at this. Who's voting for that? And as a woman sues a food company because her recipe took too long to cook, have we lost the art of patience? Plus tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20 right through until 11. And in my take at 10, a woke pressure group wants to cancel Christmas. Well, I'll be cancelling them. No one's pulling my cracker. To debate that and all of the big stories of the day, my all-star panel of journalist and former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards, writer and wellness expert, Emily Lavinia, and political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Colvia Ranger. 
Now, I want to hear from you throughout the show. Mark at gbnews.uk. This programme has a golden rule. What is that golden rule, Sebastian? What is that rule? We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. So there you go. Two hours of big debates, big guests and always big opinions. Let's start with this one. The two primary functions of the state are to police our borders and to keep law and order at home. Well, it's clear we're struggling on the former and outright failing on the latter, with just 6% of burglaries, for example, leading to a conviction in England and Wales last year. Which is why the next story is symptomatic of the country at the moment. A have-a-go hero who ran two burglars off the road, said it was a slap in the face when he was jailed for two years whilst they walked free, in part because of their injuries. Adam White was jailed in February for 22 months for causing serious injury by dangerous driving after he ran the would-be burglars off the road whilst the crooks themselves were spared prison. Speaking to Mail Online, Mr White revealed how being sentenced was the worst day of his life, and he spoke about his agonising time in prison as well as the impact it continues to have. Well, a friend of mine had a similar experience a couple of years ago. This guy is a pensioner and was walking down the street with a phone in his hand. Two scumbags mounted the pavement on a moped and grabbed his hand to get the phone. What they didn't realise is that although my friend is in his 70s, He's ex-SAS. Oh dear, they picked the wrong man. As he physically resisted their efforts, the rider of the motorbike, the young criminal, produced a massive blade. My friend grabbed his arm, twisted it and forcibly detained this young scamp until the police eventually arrived. What was the first thing they did? The police questioned my friend, who's had his life threatened for a mobile phone, and they asked him why he injured the young criminal. It gets worse, this young criminal, whose wrist was broken, tough luck, mate, was released with a caution, and my friend went to court for his so-called attack on someone that threatened to kill him. Rightly, the judge took look one, at this case, one look at this case, and he threw it out instantly. But it tells you everything you need to know about our bonkers criminal justice system. Criminals should be afraid to break the law to steal our possessions and threaten our safety. Instead, they commit their crimes with impunity, knowing they're unlikely to get caught. Instead, they're laughing at us. Meanwhile, this week, The Guardian's Polly Toynbee writes that prison doesn't work and we should somehow release these people or lock fewer up. What a terrifying idea. Of course, I doubt Toynbee would be impacted by such measures. I'm assuming she lives in a salubrious suburb of London. It would be ordinary Brits that would suffer the consequences of a more forgiving approach to crime. Ordinary Brits who would be afraid to leave their house for fear of being robbed or attacked if they aren't already. We are now on the side of criminals, not the public. We now have a culture in which you can't put barbed wire on the fence outside your home because anybody trying to break into the house could get injured by it. Well, I say that if you enter my home or my property, you've left your human rights at the door. Don't forget the story of Tony Martin, imprisoned for shooting someone in his own house. How could he possibly have known what the burglar's intention was? He was protecting his property and his family. It was self-defence, and for that, he was punished. Tony Blair was spot on when he said that we should be tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. I'm all for tackling the issues which can be behind many crimes. Mental health, deprivation, lack of education, drug abuse, addiction, all of those things. But we've got to clobber those wrong uns too. And for the worst, repeat offenders, throw the book at them, lock them up and chuck away the key. The law is the law. It's time to respect it. It's time for the criminals to suffer some tough love. And if they don't like it, tough luck.
What's your view? Mark at GBnews.uk reacting to my big opinion monologue. Our journalist and former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards, writer and wellness expert Emily Lavinia, and political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Kulveer Ranger. Uh, Peter Edwards, uh, welcome back to the show. Good to see you again. Uh, what, uh, what is your view of the treatment of this man uh, jailed for effectively apprehending burglars? Well, he didn't apprehend them, he ran them over and he committed a crime in doing so. Now, burglary is a terribly invasive crime and I think burglary, perhaps from politicians, doesn't always get the attention it deserves. It's disgusting having your home invaded by strangers who might intimidate, threaten you and your family. I completely understand the distress it, co it caused. But Adam Wyatt was put on trial. He was convicted by a jury because he broke the law. I think it's right that he pays a price for that. What worries me, though, about this, and you picked up on it in your monologue, is that the two would-be burglars uh, did not go to prison, but they had previous convictions. Now, I would like to see burglars go to prison full stop, but when you've got previous, I think you should be going to prison for a second or third or fourth crime if it's burglary, that invasive offence. So um, it might sound very old-fashioned, but I think um, whether you're a homeowner breaking the law or a burglar breaking the law, um, you do pay a price for it. Yeah, I think that's a really fair and balanced response. Uh, Emily Lavinia, what's your view about the balance between uh, protecting the human rights of criminals and protecting the human rights of victims of crime? Well, it's a tricky one because obviously we are, at the end of the day, are all human, so we all, you know, deserve the same respect and the same rights. However, um, it is quite sad that we're, we're not able to protect ourselves and... Um, I had a similar experience recently where I was mugged and I shouldn't have chased down the offender, but I did. Um, and I should have just let the police handle it, but I didn't. And I luckily did not get in trouble for catching the person and forcing them to give my phone back. But I was terrified that I might get in trouble for that. Um, and I was just sticking up for myself. And obviously the streets out there are quite frightening. And, you know, as a young woman, I do like the idea that, um, you know, I won't be penalised for standing up for myself. Um, but, yeah, then, then again, we do have police to deal with these things. So I mean, the I... problem you've got, Emily, is that if you're in a position to restrain a criminal that's trying to commit a crime against you, you risk breaking the law yourself. You do, yeah. Um, but, I mean, in these instances as well, we, we're thinking on our feet. We're not always, you know, thinking about protecting our family, our interests, ourselves. We're not necessarily thinking about the law um, because it's a, a game of survival. So I think it is terribly sad that this, this man did go to prison. But, you know, um, there, there is a good point. You know, there is a law and it has to be upheld and there can't be one rule for one person and one for another. Uh, Kulveer Ranger, I've got no doubt that you looked at the issue of crime when you advised Boris Johnson as London mayor. Uh, this is a concerning story, isn't it? And what about the story of a good friend of mine, ex-SAS veteran, who restrains a moped thief who was brandishing a blade, the moped thief gets away with a caution, he gets a court case for breaking the guy's wrist in order to, I would argue, protect his own life. Well, it's interesting, in each of these cases, Mark, we hear the phrase, have a go hero, uh, and we place those people who are doing what we think morally is the right thing, defending themselves, their property, uh, their home, their family, uh, as being heroes. But then we see, potentially, the law being an ass, and these people being penalised, they, if they have broken the law, obviously that has to be taken into account. But the key issue here is then, are the criminals, the people who are instigating this issue, the instigating this kind of incident, are they really paying the price? And in this instance, it's sad to say, those criminals didn't. They, they were injured in the course of being knocked over, but they did not go to jail. And the, the, the man, um, Adam, who was who went to jail, and it's really terrible to read what happened to him and his family for the years of... Uh, suffering that he's had. He obviously went for, to jail for two years, but his family suffered. His wife had to have a termination. She was pregnant because they weren't sure of what, how they would be able to bring up their, another child. They had two children already. So there are consequences. But I think coming back to it, Tony Blair was right. Home secretaries need to be strong on this. Criminal justice and sentencing does need to be continuously looked at so we don't end up in a situa situation where the law is an arse and we find burglars not going to jail and those defending themselves are. Um, Peter Edwards, briefly, why can't we put barbed wire 
on fences around our property? Why do we have to worry that a burglar might injure normally it's himself? Um, I've no idea, to be honest. And I know that's it's a bit where I come silly, from. Isn't it? it's a bit I, silly. I know I come from a bit more of a left wing or human rights perspective on some of these things, but, but you, you have to get a barrister on for that one. I yeah. think there's a broader concern, which we've all talked about in some ways or another, which is um, crimes happen all the time. I'd imagine we've all been victim of crime one way yeah. or another. If that's a violent crime, you have a... So not putting barbed wire on your fence. You have a split second to make a judgment. And Emily alluded to that. And I don't think any of us could say with certainty that we'd always get that judgment right. No, I think that's a fair point. Uh, last thought on this, uh, Emily. What about... Uh, that, that guy, Tony Martin, who shot dead a burglar that was in his house in the dead of night. I would argue he had no idea what the motives of that burglar might be or if he was armed. I would argue that if you enter someone's property, you leave your human rights at the door. I mean, I'm not sure about that because I do think that um, this is an issue around whether or not we should be armed as well. Um, you know, I think if someone enters your home with an intent to harm you, you should be able to defend yourself. I'm not sure whether you should be able to shoot someone. Um, you know, that but is... the problem is, even if even if you just smash a vase over their head, you could face a couple of years in clink if that criminal pops his clogs. That's true. And, you know, we often hear, I know I keep going back to this, but, you know, cases in which women have been attacked and sexually yeah. assaulted and they've done time for you know, for trying to defend themselves against um, their attacker. And I think that's deeply, deeply wrong. So, um, yeah. yeah, I do think you should be able to defend yourself. The law is an ass. It's a big ass, and I'm no fan of a big ass. Uh, thank you to my brilliant panel who return in a few minutes' time, the brilliant Peter Edwards, Emily Lavinia and Culvier Ranger. Uh, coming up later in this hour in the News Agenda with my panel, as Labour Deputy Leader Angela Rayner is filmed dancing and doing a DJ set, is it wrong for politicians to publicly let their hair down? We'll show you the video shortly. But next in the big question, are office Christmas parties a bad idea? See you shortly. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm please. completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Well, a big response to our debate around crime and why it is that it seems the law is often on the side of criminals, not victims. This from Richard. Uh, Mark, the Macarena police are doing a great job giving cups of tea to climate protesters gluing themselves to the road. Burglary? Who cares about that, says Richard. Martin says, Mark, I've served the police service for almost 49 years. Um, 32 as a warranted officer and latterly a member of police staff. This service is more about the woke world than it is about being uh, serious in dealing with criminality. The criminal justice system does not support the victim and after almost five decades, I would never advise anyone to trust the police to do the right thing. Society now has a police service that supports the criminals and not the victims of crime. Perhaps police leadership should join Matt, Hock, Matt Hancock, I should say, in the jungle. Uh, thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, Ed says, this rot with the police starts at police training college with woke indoctrination going back years in the making with previous governments, both Labour and Tory. Uh, have a go, heroes. Wayne says, Mark, people are missing a trick. Chase, catch, retrieve your items and forget about the police. Deal with it yourself. It works, says Wayne. Um, Andrew. Hi again, Mark. We need to change the law or advise the courts differently and perhaps say that if you enter someone's home or threaten someone, then there can be unknown circumstances. And last but not least, from Bill in Glasgow. Hi, Bill. Thanks for your email, mark at gbnews.uk. Hi, Mark. I'm nearly 80 years old and I can assure you that if anyone broke into my house, I would knock their head off. Bill, I've got no doubt about that. Thank you so much. For, uh, for joining us. And uh, do keep those emails coming. Mark at gbnews.uk. It's time now for this. Well, it's time now for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. One of the great aspects of Christmas to look forward to is the office Christmas party. Or is it? After two years of lockdowns, have we forgotten the art of socialising with our colleagues? And is it dangerous? to get drunk with the boss, given the fact that you might do or say the wrong thing. With alcohol fueled hijinks and potentially naughty goings on sexually, plus the enormous cost, are office parties more trouble than they're worth? Should business and pleasure be kept separate at Christmas? Well, I'm delighted to welcome Joe Hemmings to discuss this. Uh, Joe is a leading behavioral psychologist. Uh, Joe, the office Christmas party is asking for trouble. Yes, absolutely asking for trouble. I mean, it's not just a mixing business of pleasure, but the point of a party is to be able to let your hair down, have a good time, not be judged, whatever you do. And if you're going to put work in that mix plus booze, you know, it, how can it not go wrong if you're having a good time? So it's sort of a conflict of interest from the get-go. Don't mind a departmental party. If you're with colleagues all at the same level, and you're going out together, I think that's quite nice. But once you start mixing the, the levels in the workplace, to me, it is just, <laughs> yeah, if you can avoid trouble, be a great thing. So probably well, not yes. be encouraged. Well, that's, that's the thing, isn't it, Joe? The simmering office politics can come to a head, uh, plus sexual intrigue. And we know the catchphrase of industry, don't screw the crew. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the issue. And, of course, the biggest problem is alcohol, isn't it? Uh, yes, uh, really big, because, of course, you're a bit anxious. You've got to make small talk with a bunch of people you probably don't want much to do with other than your day-to-day -day working life. Uh, so you're probably going to have a bit more to drink because it's free and you're a little bit sort of nervous about it or you, you're not that bothered. Um, that and the fact it's quite often videoed uh, or photographed, I mean, there's kind of no escape. There's a record of it either in your mind or on somebody else's phone. And 
it, there's nothing good that can come out of it. You can't go to an office party, a Christmas party, and say, wow, that was amazing. I did so well. Uh, I'm going to get on my job tomorrow and feel even more confident and more powerful and more ambitious. It's not, not going to happen. Well, no, it's not. And the worst thing is the office Christmas party in the office. Because you know what's going to happen. By 2 a.m., someone's arse is on the photocopier. Yeah, that's the classic one, isn't it? Or someone's thrown up on a keyboard, whatever. And who's going to clear that that rubbish up? No. I mean, it's it's truly a bad idea. I did some research a few years ago, and it was 75% of people said they dreaded the office party. And I was surprised how low that figure was. Because if you ever hear somebody's stories about their Christmas parties, they're sort of never good. They're memorable, but not necessarily for the right reasons. And it's one of the great things about being self-employed. I don't have to go to a Christmas party because people feel obliged to go to them. They feel if they don't go, it'll be frowned upon. So to yeah. go to an event that you don't want to go to, but you feel obliged to go to, drink too much, might make uh, an ass of yourself. It's quite, yeah, that combo is never going to kind of mesh well. I'm not a party pooper. I love a party, just not an office Christmas party. Well, well I, think, I think that's it. I think a, a big old lunch for the team is the way to go. And then if you want to have a few drinks later, as you mentioned, with departmental colleagues, uh, that might be an option. Um, Joe, let's bring in my brilliant panel because they're all veterans of office parties. Uh, former editor of Labourlist, the brilliant journalist Peter Edwards, writer and wellness expert Emily Lavinia, and political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Kulvia Ranger. And Kulvia, your former boss, knows all about work parties. Well, I, I was mentioning, actually, uh, uh, earlier about um, parties at City Hall. Uh, and I do remember Christmas parties being particularly challenging because you had five or 600 people in City Hall all coming together. And that point that Joe makes about departmental shift, you know, everyone then gets that opportunity to talk to senior people that maybe in, uh, they haven't had to be able to express their opinion to in the way they wanted to, fueled with a bit of alcohol. So I think they are dangerous. I think team events are great. I think they're challenging for the boss as well, because you know that if you're the senior person there, everyone else tends to not be able to relax while you're around and you don't want to be a party pooper. So I think a few, a few drinks amongst colleagues, amongst teammates uh, can, be, can be good fun. But I did go to a parents' evening party last night, which was interesting. First time in years that I've actually been out with my wife. And it was surprising the following day. I have, have been suffering. But to see that video footage uh, of me throwing some shapes and it suddenly brought it all back home that, yes, there is going to be records of this wherever you go at any party nowadays. I'd pay good money to watch that tape. We might broadcast it on the show on a future occasion. Peter Edwards, uh, you've been to a few work parties in your time. Yeah, my kind of former life in newspaper journalism, that was always pretty clubbable. Um, you know, they're perhaps small organisations, Colviers, you know, it wasn't five, six hundred people, but they're always good fun. So I think I defend the Christmas, the work Christmas party, perhaps now more than ever, given, given the years of COVID we have and have had, and we know that COVID is still with us. But I think there is a case for a Christmas party. You know, maybe we've all got to show a bit of restraint. But I did actually like your um, kind of alternative option as well of, you know, like a work lunch, you know, mm. paid for. And then the people that want to carry on going um, and have a bit more of a hedonistic uh, streak can go for it. Uh, and those who just want to go home, take the afternoon off, spend some time with the family. But they've got a, a ready way made to make the excuses and go. So um, I thought your, your kind of lunchtime... Uh, Christmas meal was quite a good idea. Yeah, I think Cool Veer and I would be uh, sticking around for a few drinks afterwards, maybe uh, watch a bit of Tottenham, that kind of thing. Um, let's uh, ask Emily Lavinia. Now, Emily, you are a wellness expert as well as a writer and journalist. Uh, it's not great for wellness, the old office Christmas party, is it? I mean, listen, especially romantically, we're talking here about those simmering passions which come to a head over the photocopier. I mean, you say it's not good for well-being, but there is a lot to be said for office morale and, you know, and, and enabling people to express themselves and be themselves at work. We often have to be quite divisive about our personalities. We have our work self and we have our, our social self. But, you know, these days, I think it is quite important to, to express yourself and to be who you are. With that said, I do think exercising restraint 
is very, very important, as everyone else on the panel has said. But how do you do that when you've had three bottles of Jacob's, Jacob's Creek? That is a good point, a good point well made. However, I think, you know, it also depends on company culture. Not every uh, party is going to be like Whitehall, um, and, you know, not every bar is going to be as well stocked, perhaps. But, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for, for coming together around Christmas and how good that can make you feel as a team. Um, Emily, uh, uh, what about the sex side of things? Because uh, I've got another revelation. I had a revelation about Susan Hussey earlier, which I've got to say, uh, one of my lovely viewers, uh, Ian, is not happy about. He thinks I've besmirched the reputation of Lady Hussey, who a royal insider tells me is something of an upstart. Um, I've got another revelation for you, which is uh, the national... Uh, an office Christmas party of a national newspaper last year ended in debauchery. It wasn't just drunkenness and vomitation, but there was some shagging going on as well. So sex is a real problem, isn't it, at these office parties, Emily? I think it can be. And I also think, you know, we, we hear time and time again about abuses of power and about people finding themselves in situations where they think they can maybe get away with something that they know they shouldn't do, mm. um, which, again, creates all kinds of issues. Um, and as we know, you know, yes, we should be bringing our whole selves to work, not just our professional side, but we should also have utmost respect for our colleagues and treat them as human beings. So there's, yeah. you know, no situation in which, you know, doesn't matter how many glasses of wine you've had, if, if something seems like it's not a good idea, it probably isn't. No, I mean, listen, I've got so many war stories as well. I was at a media, media party years ago and uh, a, a PA, Joe, got pregnant at an office Christmas party. That was quite the drama, let me tell you. Um, what happens if you wake up next to Stephen Accounts or Debbie from Sales? Well, I mean, and if you've got yourself pregnant. Um, look, yeah, you'll probably have a hangover, are deeply embarrassed. Everybody knows. I mean, God forbid these people might have partners, so you're kind of doing a double whammy with with their relationships or your own relationship. Look, it, it's like a tinderbox sexually because, you know, there is someone you might fancy and you've kind of had a bit of a fantasy about and then you've had a few drinks and you're kind of smooching over some tragic love song, Christmas song on the dance floor and, and off you go. So it's just dangerous. I'm listening to your panel talking about the word restraint in association with the word party. OK. I mean, I'm not sure these two kind of particularly are good bedfellows. Um, because the whole point of a party is to be pretty unrestrained and know that, that it's all going to be good, that you're in safe, comfortable, trusted company of good friends. I don't think that's possible at a work party, so it kind of just doesn't feel that it's... It can never be a good option. It's there because it's meant to bond people. However, I think it's that's a bit counterintuitive. I think it's more divisive than bonding, to be fair. Uh, listen, I'd love to go out for a beer with you, Joe. It's been a really fun chat. Behavioural psychologist Joe Hemmings, thanks for your time. Thanks to my panel as well. Well, we put the vote to you, the great British public. We asked in an exclusive GB News poll, are office Christmas parties a bad idea? 40% said yes, but 60% said no. Go and have a beer with your colleagues. Brilliant stuff. A great debate that was. Uh, coming up, we've got the papers at 10.30 with a sneak peek at 10.20 in the company of Nigel Nelson from the Sunday Mirror. Uh, also, we've got my take at 10, in which I'll be talking about a woke group who want to cancel Christmas because it's not inclusive. But next, as Labour deputy leader Angela Rayner is filmed dancing and doing a DJ set, is it wrong for politicians to publicly let their hair down? We've got the video and we'll show it to you next. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. 
That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. Now, Angela Rayner has gone viral today as she shows off her dance moves at a charity DJ battle. Take a look at the deputy leader of the Labour Party in action last night in Manchester. Well, there you go. Uh, that was Entrance, and Only Love Will Set You Free. Well, Dan Hodges, the journalist from the Mail on Sunday, was not impressed. He tweeted the following. He said, I like Angela, but Labour need to realise they've now got their best chance of forming a government for over a decade. And that involves convincing people who still have doubts that they're serious people with a serious plan for leading the country. So is it wrong for politicians to let their hair down in public? Does it give the wrong impression? Emily? I um, I think that Angela's whole thing is that, you know, she's one of the lads and people enjoy that about her and that's very much her shtick. But I would also argue that people love Boris and, you know, Boris clearly loves to party too. So I don't know that it's a bad thing because enough people have, you know, have embraced Boris and loved what he's done for the country. Some people disagree with that. But, yeah, I think um, at the end of the day, obviously, they have to set an example, but they are also human beings. Uh, Dan Hodges, previously a Labour supporter, would just suggest that the optics of that video aren't great, Colvier, at a time of national economic crisis. Now, we were talking about Christmas parties earlier, and, mm. you know, this is a time when people are going to let their hair down. Angela's letting her hair down. She's showing her human side. We're told often politicians don't look human. And, and as Emily says, she has a personality. That, that's well known. So I think she's fitting in to her time. She's on brand. She's on brand. She's on brand Angela. And I think that's great. I saw her earlier this week. She was uh, co-hosting the Political Cartoon of the Year Awards with Jacob Rees-Mogg. What a, what a pair they were on stage. So, and Jacob you know, Rees-Mogg. Yeah. Well, uh, so, PJ. <laughs> so, oh so it's, it's, I hope I don't get cancelled for that. Yeah, I'm not commenting on that one. <laughs> um, so she, she, I think it's right for her. 
But it has to be done in the context of, yes, they are going to be seen as leaders. And we all have that role, whichever, you know, if you're leading a team, if you're in a business or if you're in a work environment, if you lose that, that sense of, well, you are a serious person and it doesn't fit into the natural character that you're presenting, then I think you have a problem. But I don't think Angela has a problem doing that. The only issue I have is where was the vinyl, Angela? It looked all really digital there as a student DJ. Absolutely right. You're old school, aren't you? Of course, uh, Peter, the reason I made that remark about her decolletage is because she mentioned in an interview about her, her breast augmentation. So she's all out there in every sense of the word. Angela's Angela. Is this a win or a fail for Labour? Uh, well, I hadn't actually seen that story about decolletage, but no, mm -hmm. I, I think it's fine. And I think. How many points in Scrabble do I get for decolletage, do you think? I think probably oh, quite a few. A yeah. zillion. That's uh, a winner. <laughs> in, in terms of DJing, no, I think it, it's all harmless fun. I think one, um, the public like politicians who remind themselves. And remember, you know, go back a few years, David Cameron on holiday was quite happy to be photographed sitting on the beach, looking quite pink, a bit sunburnt, and reading the sun. Uh, and he was obviously associated with the word chillaxing. Mm. Everyone likes to relax in different ways. And as Colvier said, this is authentic. You know, if it had been Gordon Brown DJing, it wouldn't have quite <laughs> rung true because we're all different in our downtime, aren't, aren't we? Angela was obviously enjoying it. It's genuine. And, <clears throat> for, you know, for, it was for a charity, right? And that, that's the ultimate defence, isn't it? You know, you, you're, you're old enough to remember Smashy and I see the fictional yes. DJ. She's got to plead, <laughs> plead the defence. It's for charity, mate. Yeah, well, I impersonate them every night, let me tell you. Uh, you know Angela, don't you? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for her, but I couldn't say I know her well. well what, what, do you, what do you make of her as a political phenomenon? Because, I mean, she's one of the best-known, most high-profile politicians in the country. She seems to have cut through with the public, and she always does well when she stands in for Starmer at PMQs. Would she make a more persuasive leader? I think Keir Starmer's uh, doing very well, and if he's uh, elected to Downing Street and serves for a long time and then hands a baton over one day... She definitely wanted. She's got a bit more about her than than Keir. She's more Boris than Keir is, isn't she? She's arguably a populist in the mould of Boris. I think she is perhaps um, a populist. I think personality-wise, I think she's got a greater sense of personal responsibility. But actually, the thing, at least Labour folk like that I know, is you've got a mix of styles. Keir Starmer, loyally sensible. You probably wouldn't see him on the dance floor. Uh, Angela didn't have traditional education. Uh, acute and pragmatic in a different way, clearly not stupid, but she's much more out there in the way she speaks. So I think they're a very good mix. Uh, what do you think of Angela Rayner? Do you think she's got a bright political future? I mean, we're talking about her, aren't we? I mean, I do. I, I love how um, straight-talking she is, and um, I completely agree. I think she is a really good partner to Keir's very straight-down-the-line, you know, human rights background uh, persona. I think they make a very formidable team, and I do think that she is a serious person. Um, even though she has this kind of fun um, side to her where she is very authentic and very real. I wonder if we're giving her an easy ride, Colvia. This is somebody that wants to be the deputy prime minister of this country. She called uh, conservatives scum. Um, she can be quite uh, unguarded in her comments and in her behaviour. Yes, I was going to say I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the things she says, be, be it on the politics side or how she expresses some of those opinions, but she is giving a voice to uh, const uh, a community of people on the, on the Labour side that want to hear from her and that hear that sort, of, that sort of message. But I think she's also playing the John Prescott card. She is effectively the She's the ginger John Prescott, Prescott, isn't she? Well, yes, potentially. You know, there were the, the, the two Jags. Um, but, but he... You know, there's a need for Labour to have that broad church, that broad element of voices and she's playing that role at the moment. She has uh, indeed got two jags. I've seen the photos. Uh, let's uh, get your views on that, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Uh, I'll get to your emails shortly, but next up, the Queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Uh, we're talking about uh, the Labour deputy leader's disco dancing. Uh, Angela Rayner clubbing last night, uh, doing a DJ set in Manchester. Is that befitting somebody that wants to be the deputy prime minister of this country? Uh, Rick says Angela is simply doing a poor man's version of the genuine Finnish prime minister's party video that made her stronger and more popular. This, however, is staged and quite tragic. Hi, Mark. Fun show, says Chris. In the words of Mr Javid, so what? Dance like no one's looking and always wear sunscreen. Wayne says, Angela rocks. I would hire her to DJ my parties, but I wouldn't vote for her. And last but not least at this stage, Jackie says, Mark, if anyone from the front bench of the current Labour Party ever came to represent Great Britain at home or abroad, I would be ashamed and embarrassed for this country. Where is the dignity? Uh, thank you for that. Keep those coming, Mark, at gbnews.uk. It's time now for US News with the queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Hi, Kinsey. Hi, Mark. I'm fresh off my plane from Boston. I got to see William and Catherine in real life. Andrew Morton once told me it's the most fun he's had with his clothes on covering the royals. I mean, it, I felt that in my core. I w it was a thrill. Well, I'm so pleased for you. How close did you get to the royal couple? I mean, if I wanted to, I could have kissed the Princess of Wales, and I, I wanted to. I mean, she's perfect. She was so beautiful and so kind and so sweet. And um, I saw, actually, William for the first time uh, up close, too. And, you know, I, I tweeted, I could be pregnant, I'm not sure. It, that's how exciting it was. Uh, well, I think it's wonderful. I love Kate's outfit. Oh, isn't she beautiful? And I am, um, you know, I was so excited. That's one of Diana's pieces of jewelry she's wearing around her neck, that choker. Uh, Kate's outfit is a rented piece because they told everybody not to wear any new pieces of clothing. They wanted you to go vintage mm -hmm. or rent something or wear something you'd already worn before because this is all about sustainability and repairing the environment. And I thought she just looked absolutely beautiful. It's wonderful. Uh, what is the general reception towards William and Kate on their first trip to America as the Prince and Princess of Wales? 
Mark, I'm telling you, everyone was so excited to see them. I saw the headlines. I saw the headlines saying, oh, that the, there's a damper on this trip. And oh, no, terrible headlines are crushing this trip. But, uh, you know, William and Catherine, they stayed focused. They stayed kind. Um, Catherine, when I saw her, was visiting the first time, because I saw her multiple times, was visiting Harvard um, to learn about, child, you know, the way science was improving children's education. They had to, like, pull her out of the building because she she was loving on everybody, taking photos. She's just so personable. And um, everybody was so excited to see her. Multiple helicopters in the sky, hundreds of people waiting to see them and get their photos. So it was a, gr it was a really good positive experience. I'm pleased to hear that. Um, how well reported was this royal race drama involving the Queen's former lady-in-waiting, Lady Susan Hussey? It was very, very you know, it was pretty prevalent uh, out here. Uh, you know, and what I think is really unfair is that every story included the words that Lady Susan Hussey is William's um, go godmother, because we're not saying every time we talk about Prince Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein, we are not saying that that's Prince Harry's godfather, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, it is a, a pretty big story over here. And um, I I'm I'm upset over it. I mean, we know for a fact that Lady Susan Hussey, she's 83 years old. She has hearing issues. So, um, you know, I think she was getting frustrated because the communication wasn't, you know, smooth. And I don't think she's a racist. And I hate the fact that she's having to dodge conversations like this. Uh, yes, I mean, a top royal insider told me this morning exclusively in confidence that uh, that Lady Susan Hussey is a bit of an upstart, quite hard work and has previous, but he did not say that she was a racist. Uh, in the end, this one will blow over. I think it's a shame that she had to stand down, and I'm sure our late great queen would not be happy, neither would Prince Philip. Um, what about uh, the other couple, Meghan and Harry? Have comparisons been made in the United States in the last day or two between both royal couples? Absolutely. And, you know, I do think that people that are not necessarily religious royal washers notice the fact that Harry and Meghan chose to drop the trailer for not only Evictus during Harry and William's America visit, but their new Netflix documentary. Words I'm seeing repeated are desperate, pathetic, embarrassing. I mean, people are really starting to turn on the Sussexes in the States because they're seeing them for who they are. And, it, you know, th these moves, they look bitter. Yeah, they look bitter indeed. I think it's a very bad look for the couple. Um, can you tell us about revelations around Hunter Biden and his laptop? He, of course, being uh, Joe Biden's son. And this is a revelation published by the new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk. What's going on? Mark, you and I have been talking about this story for at least a year now. I mean, off and on, we've talked about this hunt. And remember when we started to talk about it, it was kind of iffy. We didn't want to be in the conspiracy theory Correct. zone. We didn't want to look like we were just pitching a fit because we weren't getting our way. It was a very delicate story. But the fact of the matter is Twitter uh, st blocked this story from being distributed on its social media network, blocked this story from being distributed in direct messages, in private direct messages, suspended users, including Donald Trump's spokesperson for trying to share this story. This is a total breach of ethics. I mean, where do, where are your morals and your values? Um, and, tw and Elon Musk, actually releases these behind the scenes conversations of people trying to justify blocking the story where they claimed that this information was illegally obtained hacked no he no the guy got messed up and accidentally left his laptop at a repair shop this this was not illegally obtained hunter biden is just an idiot um so it's it's a really interesting story and i, I just think it goes to show we really cannot trust these social media outlets with our information and we're giving them a lot of it for free and we re we really need to reevaluate our relationship with social media we do well very very briefly uh, what is alleged to have been on hunter biden's laptop because i understand that what might have been on it is so revelatory and so scandalous if the news had come out joe biden might not have won the presidential election 
I mean, absolutely. I mean, Joe Biden in relationships with foreign governments and, and with, with foreign businesses um, where there, there is a financial relationship between Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. Uh, but the only reason that financial relationship exists is because Joe Biden can do things in government to help these people that don't, you know, that are out of the country. Um, very salacious photos of Hunter with women and and um, Hunt, Hunter doing drugs. I mean, it is a cesspool of sin, if I'm being completely honest, and not a great reflection on the Biden family. Uh, yes, I mean, it's bad. It's obviously not as bad as uh, my laptop, which is why I'll never be getting that repaired at PC World. And on that salacious note, Kinsey, brilliant stuff. Um, free speech has been restored to Twitter and it always existed here on GB News and it's always a thrill to see you exercise it. The brilliant Kinsey Schofield back from Boston having met the Prince and Princess of Wales. Do check out her brilliant royal website to die for daily. No doubt she'll be writing up that experience on the website shortly. The brilliant Kinsey Schofield, always the highlight of the weekend. Uh, lots more to come. In my take at 10, the woke pressure group who want to cancel Christmas because it's not inclusive. I kid you not, uh, no one's pulling my cracker. We'll discuss that next. Plus tomorrow's papers in the company of the political editor of the Sunday Mirror. See you soon. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. It's 10 o'clock. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my take of 10 in just a moment, the woke pressure group who want to cancel Christmas because it's not inclusive. I'll be dealing with them shortly. No one's pulling my cracker. 
We'll catch up uh, with all of the big stories of the day alongside my all-star panel. And tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20 in the company of the Sunday Mirror's political editor, Nigel Nelson. Lots to get through, but first the headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Border force officers and firefighters could be replaced by military personnel due to scheduled strike action over Christmas. It's part of contingency plans announced by the government. Around 2,000 members of the armed forces are now being trained alongside civil servants and volunteers. It's hoped the measures will help to limit disruption, with multiple unions deciding to strike in the coming weeks. The Home Secretary says she told the head of the police watchdog to resign or face immediate suspension after he became the subject of a criminal investigation. Michael Lockwood had been Director General of the Independent Office for Police Conduct since 2018. He resigned yesterday, citing personal and domestic reasons. In a statement, Suella Braverman said she took immediate action upon being made aware that police are investigating a historic allegation. Protests have been held in over 40 locations across the UK over the fuel poverty crisis. Activists unfurled a banner on Westminster Bridge saying, we demand to be warm this winter. Protesters say many people now can't afford to heat their homes, whereas energy companies continue to profit. Animal rebellion activists have staged sit-ins at two restaurants in London and Manchester. Eight people entered Salt Bay's steak restaurant in Knightsbridge and sat at tables which were already reserved. Video posted on the group's Twitter page appears to show one protester being ejected. A further 16 supporters occupied Manor in Manchester, which features in the Michelin Guide. Animal Rebellion is calling for a plant-based future and says luxury dining represents climate devastation. England will face the winners of the Africa Cup of Nations tomorrow in their first match in the knockout stage of the World Cup. Senegal won their title only seven weeks ago. And they were also runners-up in their group. However, the three Lions are favourites to go through to the next round. Well, ahead of that game, England captain Harry Kane has sent the best wishes of himself and his squad to former footballer Pele. The 82-year-old is currently battling colon cancer and was recently admitted to palliative care, where he's said to be stable. Kane says he cherishes advice he received from the football legend, who he describes as an inspiration. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News, the People's Channel. Back now to Mark. Uh, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. My thanks to Ray Addison, who returns in an hour's time. It's three minutes past 11. In my take at 10 in just a moment, the woke pressure group who want to cancel Christmas because it's not inclusive. In the news agenda with my panel, as a woman sues a food company because her recipe took too long to cook, have we lost the art of patience? Tackling all of those stories tonight and many more are my all-star panel of journalist and former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards, writer and wellness expert, Emily Lavinia, and political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson and celebrity Spurs fan, Kulveer Ranger. Plus, tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11. And we'll be joined tonight by the longest serving political editor in the country, the excellent Nigel Nelson. And I want to hear from you throughout the show, mark at gbnews.uk. Lots to get through. Let's start with my take at 10. Bar humbug. Wales Online report that a group that works with organisations on issues of diversity and inclusivity says it may be time to cancel Christmas. The call comes after new statistics showed that less than half of the population of England and Wales described themselves as Christian in the 2021 census. The group say that from November onwards, the decorations in town centres 
the advertising on our televisions, the constant emails from retailers all imply that everyone will be celebrating on December the 25th. But they say that many people feel left out and excluded from the celebrations whilst their own religious festivals are ignored. And many feel under pressure to spend large amounts of money for no real reason. Now, I love diversity. I think it's the best thing about this country. Britain is the most integrated society in the world. It is a global beacon of diversity, assimilation and inclusion. But inclusion does not mean the substitution of our traditions and values for someone else's. Although few people still attend church, Britain is ultimately a Christian country, which celebrates occasions like Christmas and Easter. It's why we love it. And it's why the people that come from elsewhere to make their lives here love it too. To cancel Christmas in Britain would be like cancelling the wonderful festival of Diwali in India or the Chinese New Year in China. And I can't imagine that uh, these diverse groups in this country are seeking to cancel Christmas. Most Jewish people, Hindu people, Muslim people, you name it, whilst not necessarily celebrating Christmas in a formally Christian way, generally participate in one way or another, whether it's the exchange of gifts, the office secret Santa, some tinsel around the Christmas tree, or just meeting up with friends and family. Because Christmas is not a one-size-fits-all occasion. It's wonderfully flexible. And in terms of what you do on the 25th, it's very much each to their own. But it's a time of year when we celebrate and when we have fun. And it's typical of this tedious, self-loathing, Britain-hating woke brigade to try to suck the joy out of what is, for most people, the very best time of the year and something to which we all look forward. And I can't think of a time when we've needed the joy of Christmas any more than right now, after the last couple of years that we've had. Post-pandemic, this is a precious moment when families feel safe enough to get together again, having been torn apart due to COVID. So if you think you're going to cancel Christmas, think again. No one is pulling my cracker. I can't bear the watering down of this great occasion, which politicians and corporations are increasingly guilty of doing. I had a wonderful tradition of buying my favourite tea from a certain supermarket. It was in a red box and it was called Christmas tea and it was Christmas tea bags. I don't know what the hell difference it was between Christmas tea and normal tea. It actually tasted the same. But I like the fact that it had the word Christmas on the box. But a couple of years ago, they changed it to festive tea. So it's not Christmas tea anymore, spoiling all the fun. You might think I'm overreacting, it might seem minor, but it's an example of how this wonderful occasion is slowly being airbrushed away by people who either don't like Christmas or are even ashamed of it, as they are of Britain and its history. Like millions across the country from all backgrounds, cultures, races and creeds, I will be celebrating Christmas big time. There will be Santa, there will be a Christmas tree, there will be tinsel, there will be fairy lights, and I won't let any miserable Scrooges Stop me. I will even get my balls out. My, my balls are quite bouncy, aren't they? Holly, what did you call them earlier? Something of steel. Baubles of steel. There you go. Now, look, will it survive that? Yeah, they're pretty sturdy. There you go. Brilliant stuff. Uh, what do we think? Let's get the views now of my wonderful panel. We have Peter Edwards, uh, we have Emily Lavinia, and we have Kulvia Ranger. Uh, Kulvia, what do you think? Uh, those uh, joyless, woke uh, cranks are trying to cancel Christmas. Well, I think you're putting some joy back in just watching your balls bounce around the studio floor has been quite interesting and fun for me, Mark. But look, it, it always feels that people are trying to take the fun and the joy out of things when they're trying to take away from cultural celebrations like Christmas. Christmas is a fundamental part of this country, of Britain, of the culture that we all share. For those of us who come from different backgrounds, but I've been born and brought up in London, Christmas is a huge part of my life, my family's life. I don't want to see it changed. I, I look to celebrate it. And I've seen this country embrace other celebrations, as you mentioned, you know, Vasaki, Diwali, 
we're celebrating all kinds of things. And it's actually about celebrating, not stopping. So I think we have to be absolutely clear what we're trying to do here is celebrate and bring people together, especially the family point that you made. And I think fundamentally, if that group wants to try and cancel Christmas, I'll like to see them try and stop all those Christmas songs that are played. Uh, and if they do manage it, maybe if they could just take last Christmas out, because I'm fed up with that one, but I'll keep all the other Christmas songs. Uh, yes, I mean, Corvier, Christmas won't be about the birth of Christ uh, to many Brits who aren't Christians anymore and to many Brits who uh, come from different cultures uh, and their families may emanate from the Caribbean or from Asia, you name it. Uh, but I don't think that these wonderful diverse groups that make up the rich fabric of our society would seek to cancel Christmas either. Not, not at all. Look, my son only this week took part in a nativity play um, uh, and played Mary. But, uh, you know, but so the, it's not just uh, a celebration, a holiday. It, there is history, there is religion, and there's understanding. And people's understanding of other cultures brings people together. It makes us stronger. So we, we shouldn't look to forget these things. We shouldn't try to airbrush them out. We shouldn't try to not feel like we're going to insult people or it's going to, you know, be something that they're going to take offence by, by saying Christmas. No, we should celebrate it and we should recognise it and we should remember what it stands for. Uh, Emily, am I overreacting to the fact that a certain supermarket used to sell Christmas tea in a lovely red box? And I just... The reason I bought this Christmas tea is because it would be probably late November, early, early December, and I'm thinking, this is fantastic, you know, this signifies the beginning of the season. And now it's festive tea and it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Well, I'm a massive Christmas fan. I love Christmas and everyone that knows me knows I'm obsessed with it. But I also think it doesn't really matter what you call it. Humans have always had a winter festival. We have always had that, you know, since the dawn of time, whether it was, you know, pagan or whether it was an ancient tradition in another culture, whatever you call it, we've always had this time of year where we come together, we put up decorations to make ourselves feel more joyful because it's a very cold time of year and we're celebrating the death of the old year and the birth of the new one coming. Um, whatever religion you are, wherever you are, we're going to celebrate that. So I do think that, of course, no one wants to cancel that, but I don't think it really matters what you call it either. And whether or not you are, you know, from a different denomination or whether you celebrate, you know, other holidays and other festivals, you can still lean in. I think it is quite secular now. Anyone can celebrate it and it is a great festival. I hear what you're saying, uh, Emily, but I think that, as George Orwell said, language shapes thought. And I think it does matter what you call it, because I think if you stop calling it Christmas, you effectively erase Christmas, you erase that history, you erase the message. I mean, I wouldn't seek to rename Diwali or the Chinese New Year or Hanukkah. Yeah, I mean, you do make a very good point. And, but, I, you know, Christmas is also something that, you know, certain people have started celebrating at certain points and have stopped celebrating at other points. Mm. You know, we know now that fewer people are going to church and maybe for a lot of people it's not about the birth of Christ and it's more about getting the family together and exchanging presents. So um, I think however you hold Christmas in your heart, as they say in the Christmas Carol, that's what's important. Uh, but, Emily, is there anything worse than that American expression, happy holidays? Yeah, it is annoying, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I always say Merry Christmas, but each to their own. Each to their own. Peter, what's your view on this? Well, I thought Colvier made a number of good points. You know, I, I, I'm a Christian and I, I'll be celebrating Christmas. And I, and I live in East London, which is one of the most diverse parts of the UK, and I've never met anyone from any culture who's offended at the prospect of um, either themselves or other people celebrating Christmas. And I think... As Colvier said, you know, British culture has adapted and it's open enough and inflexible enough that people from all backgrounds can mm. mark Christmas. Now, for people like me, that might be um, in a religious way. For other people, it might be getting together with family, having time off work or, or a time of remembrance, perhaps for loved ones who are not here anymore. Mm. And I think so I think to me, um, you know, I, I know Christian culture because I perhaps best because I've lived in Britain, you know, all my life and it is very flexible and it is very open, but but it has a it has adapted, and we've got lots of things that come out of uh, Christian culture, like schools and churches and food banks and hospitals. But but the, the fundamentals of that, like education and charity and family and coming together, and then looking upwards at certain times of the year, are seen across uh, all major faiths. Uh, do you think, Peter, that this is a subtle dilution of British values? Uh, is it a Britain-hating gesture? 
No, 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 I don't think it is. And um, um, there was a bit of a riot smile on my face as you went through your monologue, because there's often a story like this every year, and one normally associates it with um, uh, local government misinterpreting some national guidelines and telling school kids they're not allowed to celebrate Christmas, and it, it pops up in the Daily Mail. It, it, was, it was slightly different this year. I think it was a, it, it was a, a, wo a woke group in Wales, as you called them. But Chris Christmas is, is in no danger of being cancelled, just like... Uh, Diwali and Hanukkah and Ramadan are in no danger of being cancelled. A fascinating conversation. Uh, what's your view about the idea that Christmas ought to be changed, uh, possibly got rid of or, or just adapted in order to be more inclusive? Uh, let me know your thoughts. This show is a broad church, no pun intended. So whatever you think, drop me a line, mark at gvnews.uk. Uh, next up, we'll be joined by the longest-serving political editor in the country, Nigel Nelson from the Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People. And we've got a first look at tomorrow's papers. See you shortly. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Well, a flood of Christmas-related emails coming in. A crazy group in Wales are calling for the erasing of Christmas, either to reframe it, dilute it, change its name, in order to make it more inclusive. Well, you're not having it on email. Um, let's have a look at what you are saying, mark at gbnews.uk. David says, Mark, this is nothing new. In the early 60s, Christmas began to be referred to as Xmas. There is dis the destruction of our culture has a long history. Uh, great show, says Dave. Dave, thank you for that. Uh, ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas to you and your family, says Dave. Well, Dave, 
Merry Christmas to you and your family as well. And Merry Christmas to everyone that's watching. Um, I'm not going to apologise for doing a lot of Christmas stories in the next couple of weeks because I think we need a bit of cheering up, don't you? So it's Christmas all the way. By the way, what do you think of my balls? They're big, aren't they? Big and shiny and bouncy. Um, golden balls. That's how I've uh, been referred to by Cool Via Ranger, who's on the panel tonight. Let's see if I can... There you go. I've missed a vocation, haven't I? Could play for England doing the cricket. Um, let's have a look now at tomorrow's papers. And uh, we'll bring you, of course, a full roundup at 10.30 with uninterrupted panel reaction. Uh, but first, uh, let's get the views of the longest serving political editor in the country, Nigel Nelson, who's the political editor of both the Sunday Peeper and the Sunday Mirror. Great to see you, Nigel. Nigel, before we get to the papers, what do you think about cancelling Christmas? Uh, I should be celebrating Christmas. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, I really object to those Christmas cards which have, uh, fest you know, happy festive season in there uh, or enjoy the holidays or something like that. No, I mean, Christmas is Christmas. I don't think we need to change the name. And I'm sure most people won't anyway. Am I overdoing it? <laughs> Yeah, just a shade. <laughs> I've overdone it. I tell you what we'll do. We better get down to some hard politics. Let's have a look at uh, the uh, Sunday Mirror, which I understand, Nigel, you've just put to bed. So let's have a look at the front page of one of my favourite Sunday dailies. And the Sunday Mirror, match of the prey. Lions to pounce in crunch World Cup game. Of course, they're playing uh, Senegal and uh, they do hope for victory. We will be, by the way, on air straight after the game, and we've got Big Sam Allardyce reacting to that. So do join us at nine, which is straight after the game. Who needs Gary Lineker when you got Big Marky Dolan? Also, Harry and Meghan, TV warning, utterly explosive. The royal family has been warned to brace themselves for a TV bombshell that could divide the nation. Harry and Meghan's Netflix series is due this week. It's expected to be explosive and very damaging, according to a top insider. Uh, Sunday People, which is Nigel's other paper. Uh, Netflix Fallout, William or Harry, the public will have to choose. And yes, we can. Millions ready for the lions to roar. And last but not least for now, uh, the Sunday Telegraph. Pharmacies drafted in to break NHS strike. Chemists could be given powers to hand out antibiotics as health workers walk off the job. Also, Quango boss... Uh, uh, TARS charity with anti-trans claim. Uh, a senior figure at Britain's biggest, Art Quango, branded a gay and lesbian charity divisive and anti-trans days before its funding was withdrawn. Ban Albanians from claiming asylum, says a top minister, that's the immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, and Kate and Meghan pitted against each other in Netflix series. Uh, lots of stories to get through. Um, and look, it's very clear what the big story is for the Sunday Mirror. And it is that documentary and that royal couple, Nigel. Yes, indeed. And I think that, that what you've got is two big events coming up this week. Uh, the first is, go is going to be tomorrow with England versus Senegal at seven o'clock. Um, and the second one will be Thursday, or we think it's Thursday anyway, when Prince Harry's Netflix series begins. Uh, what we're hearing is that it's going to be a lot more worrying to the royal family than even they thought. Uh, we know that Prince William has come back from America for crisis talks with the king about this. Uh, they've got to actually decide how they're going to approach this, depending on what Harry and Meghan says. Question really, I think, here at the moment, especially as we've got a, a, a new king, is whether or not it's just damaging to the royal family, which I don't think is quite so important, or actually damaging to the monarchy, which I think is. And that will obviously be the concern of both William and Charles. Indeed. And uh, the only story in town when it comes to uh, England, certainly, is uh, England-Senegal, the big match, uh, Absolute cover to cover uh, reporting on this from the Sunday Mirror and the people who I think win uh, headline of the day. Yes, we can, referring to England's captain. Yes, that's right. Uh, a lot of hope invested in uh, the Spurs player, of course, the England captain, Harry Kane. And let's hope he's got his shooting boots on 
for the big game tomorrow. Once again, let me reiterate that big Sam Allardyce uh, with us tomorrow to react to that game. Um, can we have a look at this story in the Sunday Telegraph? Pharmacies drafted in to break the NHS strike. Um, who's going to come off worse from this strike, Nigel Nelson? The government or the nurses themselves? Well, we'll have to see. I mean, at the moment, I think the sympathy is with the nurses, although their pay claim is very high. The idea of trying to go for 19.6% in the current climate is going to be really difficult. It doesn't mean that it's not a reasonable claim, because they've lost 20% uh, of their real pay over the last, uh, 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 since the Tories came into power, over the last 12 years. But um, obviously, 19.6% 19, 19 is an awful lot. We will have to see. You can imagine that the government are finding all sorts of different ways of trying to break the strike. They've just announced 2,000 troops have been put on standby. They'll be there to, to drive ambulances, become firefighters, even border guards. Now, the, the idea of, the, of pharmacies being given the chance to uh, uh, put out antibiotics, to actually write prescriptions for antibiotics, it's only a sort of an, an escalation of what pharmacists do now. And the more pharmacists actually can take over some of the roles of GPs, I think the better. I had my COVID uh, top-up jab at a pharmacist. He didn't have the flu jab at the time, went to another pharmacist and got that. So those are things that only a few years ago you wouldn't have been able to do. I'm a big fan of the pharmacists. An untapped resource, and as you said, they're capable of... Uh delivering so much medication and so much care. Uh, Nigel, brilliant to have you on the show. I look forward to uh, reading both the Sunday People and the Sunday Mirror, of which you are the political editor. Uh, my thanks to Nigel Nelson. All of the papers, next. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It is exactly 10.30 at this time. Every Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we bring you the full rundown of the papers with full panel reaction from three good friends of mine, journalist and former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards, writer and wellness expert, Emily Lavinia, and political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Culvia Ranger. Uh, brilliant stuff. Well, let's hit those front page headlines. It's the Sunday papers and lots of stories to get through. Uh, we shall start with The Independent. Take a look at this. OK, and they have England's hopes for World Cup clash. Captain Harry Kane is all smiles as the team prepare yesterday for the game against Senegal. Of course, yesterday refers to uh, today because these are tomorrow's papers. Uh, it is the big game. It's at seven o'clock. It will be over before nine and we'll be doing full reaction here on Mark Dolan tonight in the company of Big Sam Allardyce. Another story on the front page of the Indy. Ministers stall on plan to end use of migrant hotels. The government is yet to begin construction of promised reception centres that were planned to house up to 8,000 migrants. The plan was announced to fanfare more than a year ago, but no new facilities have been set up and almost 50,000 asylum seekers and refugees are now being housed in hotels at a cost of just under £7 million a day. Uh, also, uh, why children need to have, to have the flu vaccine from Emily Atkinson in that paper. And is it so weird to be a female train driver, asks Jane Fentiman. Uh, next up, The Observer. Ministers accused of spoiling for a fight with nurses on pay. Ministers were under intense pressure tonight to open new pay talks that could avert a devastating series of NHS strikes as health unions suggested a deal could be struck if both sides were willing to negotiate and compromise. Also, Afghans face torture after UK breaks its pledge to help Afghan nationals who were promised resettlement in the UK nearly a year ago are facing torture and death whilst they wait for a response from the British government. Very worrying story, that one. How about the Sunday uh, Times now? Let's see what the Sunday Times are leading with. Um, and they have, no less, panicking Tories plan tough new laws on asylum. And once again, Harry Kane there, uh, pictured on the eve of a very important game in the World Cup against Senegal. Let's go to the Sunday Express now. William, I will fight back. Prince's warning shot to Harry and Meghan on the eve of Netflix show. The Sunday Telegraph. Pharmacies drafted in to break the NHS strike. A story I discussed with Nigel Nelson from the Sunday Mirror. Pharmacists will be drafted in to help break NHS strike action and ease winter pressures on the health service under plans being considered by ministers. Chemists could be allowed to diagnose patients with minor conditions and prescribe antibiotics for the first time to try to reduce demand for GP appointments and cut record backlogs. Also ban Albanians from claiming asylum, says Minister. Albanians should be barred from claiming asylum as part of a crackdown on illegal immigration. Uh, Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, said it was very hard to see how Albanians should be able to successfully claim asylum when they came from a demonstrably safe country. Uh, the Mirror, match of the prey, Lions ready to pounce in crunch World Cup game. Harry and Meghan TV warning, utterly explosive Netflix show is worse than royals can imagine. Sunday people, yes we came, millions ready for Lions to roar. Netflix fallout, William or Harry, the public will have to choose. And last but not least, the Daily Star Sunday. Come on England, let's give Lineker's lugs a rub for good luck. Uh, here's how you can help England beat the ITV curse against Senegal. Give Gary Lineker's ears a rub and pass on the BBC's 
uh, BBC Star's good luck. That, of course, referring to uh, Gary Lineker's rather healthily large ears. Job done, say the Daily Star Sunday. And those are your front pages. Uh, let's get full panel reaction and a fascinating story there, Culvier, in the Sunday Telegraph about boosting the role of pharmacies. I've thought for a long time now that pharmacists should be able to do more. Well, they did, didn't they? They stepped in when we had to do the vaccination rolling. They are still stepping in. And, in fact, I'm sure most of us went and got our vaccination done at a yep, local pharmacy. Yep. And what I saw was them putting in infrastructure that would be able to be used more, for more things, for more purposes. And I think th there's a talent and an untapped resource there, especially we all hear about the pressure on the NHS, we all hear the pressure on our GP surgeries. Why not? So I think pharmacies are there, we can use them better, so I think it's quite right that we look to get this uh, more services done at our local pharmacy, which actually we probably tend to know better than our local GP nowadays. Well, that's right. This feels like a wartime measure that could stay in place like so much that did happen during the war. Yes, you're right. And in fact, you, you realise that they become part of a community. The pharmacy, we, we've seen the fragmentation of how GP surgeries have sort of evolved. You don't really see the same GP every time you go back, if we're honest. But you do see that familiar face, the local pharmacist, the person who's owned the shop or the business for quite a while. And that's trust. That's something that then you go and ask for guidance. I have to say, today, we went to the pharmacy because our son, my son wasn't feeling too well. We asked the local pharmacist for the guidance and, in fact, the medicine. So they are playing an increasing role for families in the community. And I think we need to look at what they can deliver uh, in terms of more services as well. Yeah, definitely. I think this is a win-win, isn't it? I mean, some might worry that as pharmacists are less qualified than doctors, they shouldn't be handing out medication, deciding if you need antibiotics. But I think we're in an emergency now. I, I think that we are. I think we've been very, very stretched in this country for a long time in terms of our healthcare resources and providers. Um, and also, we're seeing so many um, new companies pop up, telehealth companies, femtech companies, that are offering something at cost. Um, some people can't afford that. You know, we're in a cost of living crisis. So if your local pharmacy can support you and can help by giving you the advice and guidance you need, great. You know, obviously we need these services. We need them provided in the community. Yeah, I mean, do you use your pharmacist? I'm endlessly going to my pharmacist and showing him my rashes. I, I always have. He's seen more of my body than Mrs Donan of late. <laughs> I think, yeah, your, your you know, local pharmacy is really useful. And, you know, for women's health as well, we're, we're always having to be, you know, if you want contraception, if you need something prescribed by your doctor, you don't go to your GP for that. You go to pick it up at the pharmacy. You have a relationship with them. Um, you know, that's always been the case, especially for you know, things that maybe have been overlooked in women's health where you're not taken seriously and you can't see your GP, you always have to go to a pharmacy. That's just part and parcel of being a woman. And the pharmacy is better than Dr Google, isn't it, Peter? Well, anything involves seeing a person um, who's qualified is better than Google. Um, I think Emily made a lot of good points, but I do have some concerns about this. One is around privacy. You know, when we, certainly when I had my third COVID jab, it was in a tiny little room, probably an impromptu one. Yeah. But... If you've got a health problem, you don't necessarily want to stand in the queue and then articulate it um, with a bunch of people behind you. The other point is familiarity. And I appreciate we're not in um, the world of the 1950s GP where people live in the same place for 50 years all the time. But your GP does generally know you. And for anyone, I think, with children or older relatives, that's particularly important. And to give perhaps the most obvious example, the, the GP that knows you can say, oh, you know, that cough you've had for a while, could there be something more sinister behind it? Yeah. So I think the continuity of the relationship is a really good thing. So uh, I think I'm a huge fan of pharmacists. I think I've got a huge amount of skill, but there, there are potentially things being lost in this plan. Well, I wonder whether what the government could do is offer them some resource. So, for example, help these pharmacies to have an area within the property to actually, like a private area, like a, like a viewing or a consultation room, perhaps. You know, that might be a solution, mightn't it? That would help. Uh, with some of it, it wouldn't help with familiarity and continuity. But um, I believe in when pharmacists took on the, the later round of COVID jabs, um, often jab number three or jab, jab number four, that was in an ad hoc room set up. So some of those could be made permanent. But of course, if you're adding a room into a chemist, you're taking out something else, mm. whether it's staff or it's medicine or storage. Yeah, I, I think that's the point. Uh, w one aspect of this as well, Colbert, is that uh, what percentage of people that go to the doctor just need antibiotics? So that will already eliminate many GP appointments. Yes, and, and I think, you know, taking on what Pete's saying, pharmacists have made the investment. You can see there is, there is a serious business model here because mm. you saw that I saw local pharmacies building the type of infrastructure that wasn't just temporary, it, it's semi-permanent. 
you can see a direction of travel here where pharmacists know that there is business and they're being paid for that by the government for providing those services. They will be paid for that. So you're losing footprint on something else. You might be selling hairbrushes, toothbrushes, toothpaste, etc. But you know there's a business model that works for pharmacists as well. So I think that there is a win-win here. The service that we need, pressure off the GP practices, a relationship in the community, and more services easily and readily available. Uh, Kulveer Ranger, whisper it, is this the beginning of huge reforms within the NHS? Is this the, the thin end of the wedge? There, look, there does need to be reform in the NHS because we can't carry on as we're carrying on. We have we lurch from crisis to crisis. It's not to about crisis. money anymore, is it's it? It's not because we we kept we do keep hearing that large amounts of money are given to the NHS, but we don't seem to see be able to solve the problem. We have the problem in our hospital services, with our ambulances, in our GP practices. Where is there not a problem? So money's promised. Politicians can keep raising the stakes on how many billions they're going to put in. But there does need to be some reform. Maybe this is the start of it. It isn't about money anymore, is it, Peter? I wonder whether the politics of this have changed now. And if we look to Labour as the potential next government, they're going to need more than just pounds, shillings and pence here. They're going to need ideas. I think it's money and reform. It's not, it's not one or the other. I think money does play a part. And some of us, or perhaps the people that we care about, um, will have had experiences in perhaps slightly run-down hospitals that do need a lick of paint, if not more than that. But it, it will also about be reform as well. And I think um, there's a general presumption that Labour on key public services will always offer to spend a bit more. I think that's priced in. So I think it is going to be a, a reform agenda that helps Labour win on health if it is to do that. And I think Wes Street and the Shadow Health Secretary has kind of heard that message. He would say funding is important, but reform, very briefly, it's a question of what type of reform, because we, we've had... Whether you like it or not, we've had 10 years of changes. The and Andrew Lansley reforms, someone said they were so big you could see them from space. I'm not sure they were actually completed. Um, there, then we had a lot of tumult around um, staffing and some foreign workers leaving the service after the referendum. Then, of course, we had COVID. So it's kind of been non-stop change for a decade. Yeah, I mean, you're a wellness guru. So what do you think about the state of the NHS? What do you think is the answer? Um, well, Annie? you know, you're totally right. There, there have been so many changes that it's been very difficult to actually achieve a level playing field in order to, you know, attach reform to anything. But you're right, it's not, it's not just about money either. It's, you know, this is going to be a case of working with a coalition of ideas wherein we have to embrace innovation, we have to embrace certain elements of technology and business in order to push something forward that, frankly can work as a whole, um, but it is going to take a lot and there's a lot of moving parts to it. And maybe a bit more common sense. So, for example, consultants working... I mean, I don't mean working seven days a week, but a seven-day-a-week service. Mm. Uh, GP surgeries staying open until 10 o'clock rather than closing at 5.30, which is their latest plan. Uh, this is, I think, what the public need. They pay a lot of money for the NHS. We are customers, aren't we? Mm. Well, I think this is where we, we, again, embrace business and technology, you know. Healthcare is very important, but it is also available to a very broad and diverse um, population of people in the UK with very, very different needs. So we do need to look at that as well as you know, thinking about how we roll this service out, not just in, in large metropolitan areas, but across the UK. Uh, the ongoing migrant crisis is a massive headache for this government, Emily. Ban Albanians from claiming asylum, says the Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick in the Sunday Telegraph. Is he right? I mean, I, I'm not sure that you can um, assess whether somebody deserves a better life or not based on, um, you know, the, the, the situation of peril where they come from. Um, I think everyone, everyone deserves a chance to build a better life for themselves and their families. Um, obviously, there is legality around that, but I, I'm not sure saying Albania is not that bad means that you can close the door to a, a whole swathe of people. Uh, what do you think, Kulveer? Because uh, this will be music to the ears of many that the government make a distinction between those who genuinely enter this country uh, for fear of their lives versus um, people coming from a country like Albania, which is a member of NATO and a stubbornly safe society, a safe country, um, hasn't had military conflict for um, 25 years. It's the question that the public have about asylum seekers. We are a caring country. We care about people. We want to provide a safe haven, as Emily's saying, that we will do that. But when we see, as you say, Mark, people coming from countries where we're questioning, is there really the issue there? I think that's where the system needs to work better. It needs to work faster, it needs to work better. We saw 
uh, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, having a rather difficult time at a select committee trying to answer questions about how the system is working. Now, we've heard numerous Home Secretaries for quite a while talk about getting tough on this system. It's about time that they do get a grip of the asylum system, they understand what is required from it, and we see some results, because this is something that the British public is obviously concerned about. Uh, you served under, under uh, Boris Johnson as mayor, and uh, you got a grip of crime in the capital. Uh, do you think that Suella Bravman and indeed, and indeed Rishi Sunak are the right people to get a grip of this issue? Because I think it could be a deal-breaker at the next election. Is there time to fix it? Can they fix it? And will they? There is time to fix it. They can fix it. They've got to work hard to go through what the real issue is. Because at the moment, people have said the right things, but we've not seen the right outcomes. And I think that's what the British people want see, the right outcomes, and they can do it in time for the next election. Peter, briefly, what do you think about this? I mean, Labour can't ignore this issue either, can they? No, I think cost of living, uh, welfare and immigration are all going to be top of the agenda. I'm a bit worried about some of the immigration stuff, though, and I know it's a bit of an old adage, but it feels like government like press release. Mm, interesting stuff. Uh, more from the papers after this. See you in three. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Uh, Wayne is not having illegal immigration into the country. If someone enters Britain illegally, send them from where they came. Uh, we'll get to more of your views shortly. But it wasn't a great day for a woman in Florida when she launched a £4 million lawsuit because her macaroni cheese took too long to cook. The craft company, which makes a variety of microwave meals, didn't reportedly live up to its standards, as the woman claimed it took longer 
than the three and a half minutes for her to get the meal ready. So is she right to sue or is she taking the Swiss? And it begs the wider question, have we lost the art of patience? I worry about this, Peter, because we have, for example, don't we, Amazon Prime, which means that if you're lucky enough to have that service, which is a subscription service, you can order an item in the morning. It can be with you before 10 p.m. the same day. Yeah, I mean, I don't use Amazon, but, but there is a case that, you know, if you think of your, uh, you know, say you're a single parent and you're trying to entertain your kids, something like that, I can understand that. I do have some sympathy for the macaroni and cheese lady. Even though I'm always on your show preaching reasonableness and patience and forgiveness, I can't bear, for example, waiting in shops and it brings out my very grumpy side. And we're all British and we're very happy sitting in a queue. There's no issue about that. Uh, but it's when people aren't concentrating, they haven't got their change, they're on the phone, they've forgotten something, that's probably when I get a bit more grumpy. So I have got a sneaking... Um, admiration for the macaroni and cheese lady. Also, I don't know about you, but slow walkers on the street. <laughs> well, I, I don't mind that if the street's big enough to get around them. But, but for, obviously, we're in London. For, for my whole life, there's this been this um, slightly comic theory that Oxford Street would be divided into a fast lane and a slow lane for pedestrians, <laughs> but it, it, it'll never happen, unless it's something um, that was ever considered by the Mayor of London, Colby. Uh, but Peter, it's a good point. I would have pushed that policy forward, I'd but, go yeah, for the it. pedestrian... Lobby was Slowly. strong in terms of saying, no, we want to stay together as one community, but I agree with you. Well, Colvier, we live in a society now where you can fancy a burger, you switch on your phone and it's with you in 20 minutes. Uh, fast food, of course, has been with us since the 60s, an American invention. You can go to Weatherspoons, you can order the food in advance, it's ready when you arrive. Uh, you've got fast track at amusement parks. So if you go to Chessington or Euro Disney, you can pay a bit extra to jump the queues. Yep. I think we have lost the art of patience. I, I think we've lost the art of patience. I think we're, I'm worried about the next generation. We sound like a sort of grumpy old people sitting on the, the couch here uh, arguing about what it used to be like. But do, do will our children understand where this food is coming from? Or they, I have an issue with this story. Mac and cheese. That, that, that's not a dish that I see as a meal anyway. It so is. There's, that, there's that point. But I also felt the, the complaint here, Peter, I agree with you about, you know, time. But the, claim, the complaint was the lady saying that the time it took to unwrap the dish and take the foil, the sort of flimsy foil off, was not included in the preparation time. Dear God, now this is an American story and we know what litigation there is like. It's a $4 million lawsuit that she's pursuing here. Crackers. Yeah, That's she is crackers, crackers, so they're very quick to make. Um, look, <laughs> Emily, uh, this is uh, basically a disaster that, you know, psychologically, we are just addicted to everything being instant, instant gratification. This is not good for anyone, is it? No, it's really not. And, you know, there is a lot to be said for delayed gratification, for mindfulness. For so knowing... what is delayed gratification? For those that don't know, what is delayed gratification? Delayed gratification is essentially um, putting off uh, the dopamine hit mm. so that your, your brain is able to process the weight, embrace patience, and then you actually get a bigger dopamine hit when you eventually do achieve what you wanted to so do. So let's say there's some hideous tasks that you're not looking forward to doing. You've got to finish a company report or you've got to, I don't know, uh, varnish the garden fence. Rather than put it off, you, you do it and then reward yourself afterwards, not before. Sure, but there is also a difference between procrastination and delayed gratification. Oh. The practice of putting off pleasure um, is a good thing for your brain. Putting off something because you don't want to do it, mm, that's, that's just procrastination. See. Like. Let me give you an example as tomorrow, Sunday. Might be old fashioned. Bake a cake, you do the hard work, then you have to wait 30, 40 minutes for it to cook and cool down, then finally you get to eat it. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got kids. Is this a, a generational thing? Do you worry for kids, and you've got kids as well, haven't you, Colvier, that, that they're not used to waiting for stuff? Because, I mean, I mentioned to my team earlier, who are very vibrant, diverse, and young, fresh faced, with hope in their eyes <laughs> and joy in their hearts. And uh, I was telling them that when I was a kid, if I wanted something like, I don't know, I, I, maybe a Lego set, if I wanted that, if I spotted something in August, I knew that I would have to wait till Christmas because you've got Christmas and your birthday and that's when you get stuff. Otherwise, you wait. That's not the case for kids now, is it? Well, I think, you know, and it shows some of us are reaching middle age or they're already, we all worry about uh, our generation versus the next one. But I think the game changer is technology because my example would be something like, TV, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, there were four channels and then there were five. If you missed your show, you missed your show and you, you know, you might be well in off enough to have a videotape, a video recorder, but these things took time to come in. 
these days everything is available and that's that's good that's not necessarily a bad thing but it does mean a, a child's perception of what it can happen when is totally different. To well, us. I agree. I used to love Dynasty in Dallas and you'd have to wait a week for the next episode <laughs> and it would go out live and then the series would end and you'd have to wait half a year for the next series. Now the whole series drops, all 20 episodes, and you can binge it in a week. But um, I, can I add good. a question, that we, we, a point of value? We've got to understand value for how, these, how much these things cost because actually, you know, it's all available. We can buy it, but well, do, does the next generation then get the value? And what I worry about with my kids is... If I just get it instantly, they're not going to understand the value of having and, it. And on that note, Paul Veer, <laughs> always good value, as was Emily and Peter. Thanks for your company. And uh, we're back tomorrow at 9. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, and the UK will be generally cloudy with a keen easterly wind making it feel cold for all. Here are the details. Scotland will start the day on a chilly note with a scattering of showers. These will be most frequent in the east, but in between the showers there will be some sunshine. Skies across Northern Ireland will be cloudy with a few sunny spells. Most places staying dry all day, but the odd isolated shower is possible. The easterly wind will push showers across northern England, very few of these making it to the west where it will stay rather cloudy. Cloudy skies across much of Wales with the best chance for some sunny spells reserved for the west. Outside chances of a few showers in the east. These will be wintry over the hills. Dry but cloudy across the Midlands on Sunday, a few breaks in the cloud here and there however, there's also the chance of the odd shower, it'll feel cold in the wind. In East Anglia, it'll be cloudy and mostly dry, but a keen northeasterly breeze will make it feel cold. The coasts will be particularly exposed to this, making it feel like low single figures. Southern England will start Sunday cloudy, however, a few sunny spells are possible in the west. A few showers will continue to feed westwards during the morning and into the afternoon. Heading towards lunchtime and showers will continue to feed westwards. Away from those showers, some bright spells but feeling cold. That's how the weather is shaping up during tomorrow morning. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Um, Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like